an outgoing and vivacious mother. Everybody that met her loved her. She would make, like, everyday fun. She was vibrant, happy. She was the life of a party. Is savagely murdered. The level of brutality that was involved in the actual murder was just shocking. Her throat was slashed almost to the point where she was decapitated. Police hunt for an elusive killer. We had nothing to tell us what happened. Crime scene evidence produced basically nothing. We couldn't figure out who did it and why they did it. We were really baffled. Could have been anybody. And follow a twisted trail of evidence. Why would he use a calling card? There were 44 phone calls made up until the day of the murder. The officer found a loaded handgun and hollow point bullets. It kind of lit up like a light bulb. Until a desperate move. This was really the one shot that the police had to solve this case. Reveals a secret that stuns everyone. I was very surprised. Like, I was shocked. All of us were. I never would have expected that it would lead to this. At 10.27 p.m. on a cold Tuesday in January 2003, Ramapo Police Dispatch receives an emergency call. Ramapo 911. My neighbor just ran in my house and said his, his wife is on the floor in the house. He's here and he's sort of like in a state of shock. Let me talk to him on the phone. All right, hold on a minute. Yes, sir, I have help on the way. You stay right, right where you are until the officers get there. Do you know if your wife is breathing? No, you, I, she didn't answer me. Did you check to see if she was no, breathing? No, I walked into her room. The lights don't go on. Okay, does she have any injuries? Yes, she's got blood on her. When I cried, Evelyn, 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 she didn't move. Did you come home and find her that way? I just came home. Officers are dispatched to the home, located in a quiet family neighborhood. When I initially approach the house, I see a man with a young boy with this really blank face. Walking by, he didn't say anything to me. I noticed that he had a shopping bag. It looked like a gallon of milk. I enter the home and go upstairs to the back rear bedroom to give this woman aid, only to find that I was at the scene of a murder. You know, her injuries were so severe, she's clearly dead. She has a very deep laceration to her neck, and she has what appears to be a knife handle sticking out of her chest. And the blood is just pooled around her body. To me, it looked like the blood was still moving. And I was thinking to myself, this just happened. It could be that the killer's still in the house. So myself and another police officer went room by room and and cleared the house, and we didn't find anybody else inside. At that point now, I had to secure the crime scene. I knew that it was dark, but once it's a crime scene, you try not to touch anything because you don't know what is evidence. Detectives arrive on the scene and begin their investigation in the bedroom. The victim was lying on her back, and she had a tremendously deep wound to her neck. So deep so, you could see part of her spine. There would appear to be two stab wounds to her chest, and there was a large, I would call it a kitchen knife, sticking in her chest. We, of course, dusted the knife for fingerprints, which came back negative. The actual blade had gone through her and was stuck into the parquet wood floor. You know, it was a pretty brutal scene. She didn't appear to be dead for long. Her body was cold to the touch, but there was no rigor mortis. There was no lividity. If we looked at a potential attack of a sexual nature, there was nothing obvious to the eye. Her clothing was not disturbed. I looked for any defensive wounds. If there was a struggle, there'd be some indication on her hands. And none of that was evident. The brutality of her injuries and how many times she had been stabbed, it looked more like what we would call a crime of passion. Looking around the room, investigators discover some unusual clues. I found it kind of odd that there was no lights, but the fan in the ceiling was running. The fan light had no light bulbs in it. And in the garbage basket were three light bulbs and there was one on the floor next to it. I'm like, you know, that's just, what's this all about? And there was a wall sconce that had a light bulb that was loosened. 
To me, it would be indicative of somebody looking to hide their presence, you know, lessen the ability of the victim to see them. The house was a little bit in disarray, but it didn't look like it had been ransacked or that it was part of a burglary. There was some expensive tools in the garage. There was quite a bit of silverware, which is a burglar. They would take that, I would think. Nothing really of value was taken, and so that started raising more questions of what exactly happened here. Police examined the exterior of the house for evidence. We didn't see any types of breaks in the windows or the screens. Everything appeared to be locked and secure. On the ground, you could see a set of footprints in the snow that led to the back door. And that door wasn't broken open, but it was open just slightly. That could have been a point of entry for whoever had done this to her. Investigators speak with the homeowner, Peter Visich. He tells police the victim is his wife, 36-year-old Evelyn Visich, and that they live in the house with their two-year-old son, Ryan. Peter told the police he'd gotten home with his son and that he observed that something happened to his wife. When the police spoke to Peter and explained to him uh, what exactly happened to uh, his wife, Evelyn, it was a strange reaction. He just sort of had a very stale face. That was something that was odd to me, but it certainly didn't point any fingers at him. There was no blood and nothing in his hands or on him or on his clothes that would indicate that he had been part of the murder. While Peter is taken to headquarters to make a statement, Ryan is looked after by his grandparents. At the crime scene, investigators continue to look for any clues to who has killed Evelyn Visage. In these early stages, you don't really know the victim. And so now you have to start thinking, who would do that? And what was the reason for this brutality that was leveled against this victim? Born to a single mother in Lares, Puerto Rico in 1966, Evelyn grew up determined to escape her humble childhood. She came to this country from Puerto Rico when she was 19 to live the American dream. Evelyn landed a job at a large home improvement store in Paramus, New Jersey, where she made an immediate impression. Evelyn was a great uh, employee. She had a, such a good work ethic. Everybody loved her. She was vibrant, positive. You could hear Evelyn from a mile away. She was always happy. She loved her music. She was passionate about dancing. She was a proud Latina. She was beautiful inside and out. Such a giving person. She was very kind. Evelyn started dating Peter after they met at the store. Peter used to shop there with his father. He was very quiet, very polite, family oriented. He seemed like a good guy. Someone that she could see building a family with. That was her dream. Peter and Evelyn married and soon welcomed their son Ryan into the family. Ryan was her world. Everyone knew she had a son, and everyone knew how much she loved her son. After four years of marriage, the couple's relationship deteriorated, and Evelyn filed for divorce. Things started to go wrong. They were just very disconnected. But she wanted Peter to be a part of Ryan's life while they figured out their divorce and, and custody agreement. But Evelyn was killed before the divorce was finalized, raising police suspicions due to the nature of her murder. The ferocity, the level of violence, you would think somebody really had an axe to grind, someone that's personally involved with the victim. You looked at the nature of the crime, it suggested that it was somebody doing this for a reason. You have a couple who are going through a divorce. In these types of cases, you're going to look at the husband. Coming up. Police discover additional suspects. We learned that he had been with Evelyn the night of the murder. Maybe they were having a domestic argument, a dispute. And unearth hidden evidence. Evelyn had secretly audio taped some of the arguments and fights that they had been having. But just as the investigation falters... Maybe he wasn't the one who actually did the murder because it just doesn't make sense. Was there a piece of the puzzle that we weren't seeing? A new face blows the case wide open. He's perspiring heavily. I could see the vein in his neck beating. And I said to him, I said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. 
I already know what happened, and I'm going to prove it. Police investigating the murder of mother of one, Evelyn Visage, have their first suspect, her estranged husband, Peter Visage. You have to start thinking, did the husband do this, or is he involved in it somehow? Peter mentioned that his relationship with Evelyn was troubling to him because they were in a different place. He wanted her to stay home. She wanted to work. And um, the relationship deteriorated, and Evelyn had filed for divorce. Evelyn and Peter still lived in the same home, even though this divorce was proceeding. They slept in separate bedrooms, but they were living under the same roof. Peter claims he last saw Evelyn alive the morning she was killed. He had taken his son for the day. Uh, Evelyn had gone to work. Peter told us he went to his mother's house at 8.30 that morning with Ryan to do some household repairs. He didn't have a steady job. His parents supported him. He also did a lot of odd jobs for them that they paid him for. He stayed at his mother's house till approximately 8.30. And at that time, he went with his son, Ryan, to the Palisades Mall. Peter tells police that just after 9 p.m., he called Evelyn's cell, and she told him she was at a friend's house. She told Peter that she was on her way home and would probably be home within 20 minutes or so. At approximately 10 p.m., Peter received a telephone call from Evelyn asking where he was. Peter said to Evelyn that he was picking up milk and that he would be home shortly. Peter said that upon arriving home, his intent was to put Ryan to bed, but he said that he found it odd that the lights were not working in the hallway. He said he looked into the bedroom, he saw that Evelyn was on the floor, and he said that she was obviously deceased, according to him, and he ran back downstairs and ran to the neighbor's house to call the police. Peter Visage was questioned for over 16 hours. I mean, it was a very long interview. He never asked to leave. He never said, you know, I want a lawyer, leave me alone, anything like that. He was cooperative throughout. He agreed to provide us with fingernail clippings, hair samples, blood sample, a buckle swab for his DNA. As Peter is providing samples, investigators run a background check. There was nothing in his history indicative of this violence. Peter was typically a guy who was, if he wasn't home, working on cars, motorcycles, he was at his parents' house. Peter Visich's mother confirmed his alibi for the day and evening at the time that he said that he was there. We found Peter to be at the A.M.P. supermarket buying milk and exiting the store consistent with the times he described, confirmed by video cameras. And he produced the receipt for the milk, time and date stamped, 10.15 p.m., the amount of time it took to go from A&P, where he purchased the milk, to his house, it just would not have been possible to commit that crime and call the police from the neighbor's phone and not be contaminated in some sort or leave behind some evidence or have evidence on him. We found no sign of any injuries. We found no sign of any blood on his person, on his shoes. At this point in the investigation, there was nothing that we could find that was showing that Peter Visage was involved in the murder of his wife. He was in all these different places where there were surveillance cameras. And with a timeline that prevented him from being at the scene of the murder when it occurred. Now you have to start thinking, other than Peter Visage, who could do something like this and why would they do something like this? I asked him, what, did he have any concern about his own safety? You know, somebody came into your house, maybe they were looking for you too. Does he have any enemies? Does he owe anybody money? Does he have any uh, illegal habits, drugs, gambling? And he answered no to all those questions. And I asked him if he knew anybody that might want to do this. And he said that she did have a boyfriend and that we should look at him. Evelyn was dating another employee of Home Depot, Mike Granda. Here you have people going through a divorce, and now you have a boyfriend thrown into the mix. A motive could be jealousy, could be a fight in their relationship. The fact that she still lives with Peter could be a source of upsetment for Mike Granda. Maybe it was a jealous boyfriend who had come in there. It fit the profile for the crime scene, being that it was so horrific. The next morning, police head to Evelyn's work to interview her boyfriend, Mike, and find that her co-workers already suspect something is wrong. I remember I kept calling her because Evelyn was 
always at work by the time I got there. And she wasn't there that day. I saw detectives when they came in and I got suspicious. And I said, something happened to Evelyn, right? So the detective said to me, how would you know that? So what I said was, you just confirmed it to me. We interviewed Evelyn's co-workers and to a person, they all loved her and spoke highly of her. And she had some very close relationships with people that she worked with that loved her dearly, that she was good to them, they were good to her, they looked out for each other. Evelyn was uh, very, very loved at work. Emotionally, it was horrible. I mean, we were her friends. We were her family. She wasn't just a friend. Like She was like a big sister to me. As investigators speak with Evelyn's co-workers, her boyfriend, Mike Granda, arrives to start his shift. When Mike Granda arrived for work, we told him that Evelyn had been murdered. He was visibly upset. But when detectives ask Mike where he was the night before, his answer raises eyebrows. According to Mike Granda, he had been with Evelyn the night of the murder. At that point, you have to really look at every possibility. Maybe she was going back to her husband. Maybe she had broken up with him. Maybe it was a crime of passion. Maybe they were having a domestic argument, a dispute. We had to look at him as a possible suspect for the murder. Police hunting the killer of Evelyn Visage are focusing in on the man she was dating while in the throes of divorcing her husband. We did look at Evelyn's boyfriend, Mike Randa. There could be a source of jealousy based on the fact that she still lives with her husband during this process, so he has to be looked at. Detectives bring the 28-year-old to the station for questioning. When Michael Granda was interviewed, we asked him to describe their relationship. He said initially they were just friends, but as time went on, they became romantically involved and began dating. Investigators press Mike for details on the night that Evelyn was killed. According to Mike Granda, Evelyn and he had left Home Depot at approximately 3 p.m. Evelyn had gone to the Garden State Plaza Mall to return some clothes, and she actually was supposed to be having dinner with her son that night. But Peter called Evelyn and said, I'm going to my mother's house with the baby. So Evelyn called Michael, saying that she was free, so she went from the shopping mall to Michael Grandis' house in West New York, New Jersey. Mike claims he and Evelyn had dinner. Around 9 p.m., Peter called to say he was on his way back with Ryan, after which Evelyn decided to head home to see her son. Michael Granda's house is approximately a 40-minute drive to the Visage house. Michael Granda called her when she was approximately 20 minutes from home when she was on the Garden State Parkway. Approximately 40 minutes after that phone call, Evelyn was being murdered. We asked him to describe his whereabouts. He said that he had stayed home for the rest of the night, watched TV, and went to bed. So there was a window of opportunity where he did not have an alibi that could be corroborated by someone else. We subpoenaed his phone records to try to determine where he was. Michael's cell phone records indicated that his cell phone was in his apartment or very close by his apartment in West New York, New Jersey. If he were to drive from West New York in all likelihood, he would have to pass through a toll. We subpoenaed toll records, easy pass records. We subpoenaed some cameras, video records from some banks in the area looking for his car passing by, and none of that was ever found. So that also led us to believe that he was telling the truth. He actually was in his home at the time that Evelyn was being murdered. I never thought for one second that Mike had anything to do with it. Mike really lifted her up on a pedestal. He gave her that support that she needed. Mike made her feel beautiful. Michael was most cooperative. He offered his phone. He offered his laptop computer. He offered samples of his blood, a buckle swab for DNA, hair. He offered everything. He said, please, I know you have to look at me, cross me off the list and find out who did this. It just never even dawned on me that the police should look at me. I just tried to give them as much information as I could. I do remember telling them, like, oh, I know you guys have to suspect me. 
I told them if they wanted to search my house, they could. Uh, if they wanted to search my cars, they could. I was just very focused on trying to be helpful. After the police obtained all the information from Mike and speaking with him and speaking with others, he was uh, quickly ruled out as a suspect in the murder of Evelyn Visage. And there was just nothing to suggest that Peter Visage was involved. So if you don't believe the husband's involved, you don't believe the boyfriend's involved, you have to look at other individuals that may be involved. At that point, you know, it could have been anybody. You can't make assumptions on who it could be. You have to really look at every possibility. The day after Evelyn's murder, as police consider possible suspects, news of the crime hits the airwaves. The Evelyn Vistich murder was newsworthy just because of the area. We're in a, a small town. We don't have that many murders that it's commonplace. This was a case that really was troubling because you have a woman who was violently, brutally killed and we couldn't figure out who did it and why they did it. Hoping for a new lead, investigators look to the autopsy report to learn more about the crime. She had two stab wounds in her upper back area. Those were the initial strikes. And then she had a very deep slash wound to her throat. And then there were two stab wounds in her upper chest area, powerfully done as indicative by the fact that the knife was stuck in the floor. Based on what the medical examiner described to us, I can only imagine the sheer horror that Evelyn was experiencing. The level of brutality that was involved in the actual murder was just shocking. Her throat was slashed almost to the point where she was decapitated. It was blood curdling. She must have been scared. Somebody's in her home, she's in her bedroom. Maybe it was a burglary gone bad and she came home and had startled whoever was in her house. We circled back to examining parolees in the area, both New York and New Jersey sex offenders, people that have committed similar crimes, burglaries gone bad or robberies gone bad. At the time of Evelyn Visich's murder, there was a group of young men who were committing robberies and burglaries in the vicinity, including a Terrence Monk who lived approximately five miles from the Visich residence. I do remember that we were having burglaries in the area, and I remember that we were having home invasions too. The name Terrence Monk, like it, it clicked with me. There were cases, robberies, burglaries, and assaults where Terrence Monk committed violent acts on people that didn't cooperate. He was also implicated in a robbery probably a mile and a half from the Visage house. It kind of lit up like a light bulb. He certainly went right up to the top of the list. Evelyn Visage was killed in her own bedroom in a frenzied knife attack. And now police are investigating if a violent local burglar might be responsible. Terrence Monk was a, like a known criminal and the detectives had been dealing with him for years at that point. We had been investigating him so arduously and for such a long time there was not any possibility of cooperation on his behalf. To get the information they need, investigators take a different approach. I utilize a confidential informant to try to determine where Terrence Monk was and if in fact he was involved in this crime. He described to me where Terrence Monk was at the time that Evelyn was murdered. He told us that Terrence Monk was in Buffalo, New York and that was substantiated by witness statements and his cell phone records. It's another dead end for detectives. They press the informant for any other information that might help solve the case. This young man was so plugged in in the criminal community, so I asked him what the word on the street was. If it was a local guy, chances are in the criminal community, somebody would have been talking. And he said there's nothing on the street at all. No information about who killed Evelyn Visage. With no other leads, police re the neighborhood around the Visage home. There was multiple attempts to locate witnesses, and detectives actually went back and conducted a road stop in the area, hoping that somebody may have seen something. Nothing was discovered, and we couldn't gain anything from that. In the village of Chestnut Ridge, it's prohibited to park a vehicle on the street at night. So we also checked to see if any parking tickets had been issued, or any vehicles parked on the street, and there were none found. 
collectively between the police and the prosecution, we were really sitting there thinking this may never get solved. While investigators consider their next move, Evelyn's loved ones struggle to accept her loss. I just couldn't believe that she was killed. Evelyn, who was a, such a loved person by everyone, something like that happened to her, it makes no sense. You know, there's some people that come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. That's what they say. There was a lot of respect and love there. She would make, like, everyday fun, always laughing, having a good time. But, um, you know, that's life. I mean, you have to take every second you get, because you never know when um, it's going to end. Detectives re-interview Evelyn's friends and colleagues, hoping to uncover a tiny detail that leads them to her killer. We did speak to many of Evelyn's friends to find out if she had a lifestyle that was potentially dangerous to her or would expose her to this type of uh, demise. Her life revolved around her being a mother. She had no enemies. Everybody that met her loved her. There was not one person that met her that did not instantly take to her. She was just a really pleasant person to be around all the time, day and night. It was very puzzling. What happened? Why was this done? With a violent killer still on the streets, concern spreads through the community. In this area, this little hamlet of Chestnut Ridge, it's just not that kind of an area where you would expect anything like this. People in the community are starting to get fearful. I remember I was living alone, and I certainly had my radar up. And I was very careful coming and going, almost to the point of paranoia. I wasn't going to be a victim. Three days after Evelyn's murder, detectives receive explosive new information, turning the investigation on its head. Mike Granda came to the Round Pole Police Station with some personal items of Evelyn Visages. Amongst those personal items, we found audio tapes and a journal that she wrote in. Detectives immediately recognize the voices on the audio tapes as Evelyn and her husband, Peter. Evelyn apparently had secretly audio taped some of the arguments and fights that they had been having. Everything from any money that she spent, taking the car away from her, shutting off her phone. He wanted to be completely in control of Evelyn, so it was in stark contrast to what Peter described to us. The fact that Peter didn't describe any turmoil caused us to have some doubts about how truthful he was being. Evelyn's journal contains even more startling revelations about their divorce. He wanted custody. He was told that he wasn't going to get full custody. And he wanted the sale of the house. So if Evelyn is gone, he's got the child, he's got the sale of the house, and he can move on. When detectives try to follow up with Peter about these revelations, they're met with silence. At this point, Peter had retained an attorney, and we were no longer able to question him. So that again raised some suspicion. We went back and looked harder at Peter, based on the fact that he had the most to gain from Evelyn being dead. With Peter having an ironclad alibi, investigators consider other scenarios. Maybe he wasn't the one who actually did the murder, but you have to wonder if somehow Peter is involved in this, because it just doesn't make sense that anybody else had a reason to do this. The suspicion is enough to get a warrant to search Peter's vehicle. We had no idea at the time that that search of the van was about to unleash a whole new avenue of this investigation and turn this case totally upside down. New evidence in the Evelyn Visage homicide investigation has led police to revisit her husband, Peter, as a potential suspect. And they are now searching his vehicle for any trace of incriminating evidence. You just never know what might be that little piece. You know, whether it's a hair or a fingerprint or that one bit of DNA might be the break in the case. Desperate for any lead in their investigation, police make a critical discovery. There was an extensive search 
of Peter's van, and we uncovered in the back pocket of the middle seat of the van $3,700 in cash in a white envelope. In addition to the money that was found, there was a Sprint calling card. This was tremendous, tremendous evidence that we have just now uncovered. It offered a lot of questions. Why would a person have $3,700 cash? We examined Peter's financial status. At the time, Peter was not very solvent in terms of having any money. Somebody who's, by all accounts, broke, and he's got $3,700 in the back of his van. And of course, we couldn't ask him why, because he had already retained counsel. You have to now start wondering, why does this man have $3,700 in $100 bills left behind in his minivan? It's possible that Peter may have engaged someone to kill Evelyn. And that money was going to be used to pay off the final payment. The furthest thing from my mind was that a hitman could have been hired. That's really very rare in, in real life. Let's look at his bank accounts, his credit card statements, you know, things like that. As far as getting any solid evidence, he was involved in this. We went back and looked harder at Peter's bank accounts, stock market, anything like that, in an effort to see if he had taken any money out to try to pay somebody to maybe do this. And nothing was found to be out of the ordinary or even considered to be like a payoff. Finding no evidence Peter paid to have Evelyn killed. Detectives focus on the other item found in his van. Why would he use a calling card? Most folks, unless you don't have a cell phone or don't have a landline, don't have the necessity for a calling card. And Peter had a cell phone. He had a home phone. So we subpoenaed the records for that calling card. There were 44 phone calls made from that prepaid phone card record beginning in November of 2002 up until the day of the murder in January of 2003. Of 44 calls made on that card, almost all of them were made to an individual named Frank Thon. The name is new to detectives, but when they run it through the police database, they make a telling discovery. Police learn that Frank Thon was currently, at the time, in jail in the state of New Jersey. This is a man who's been arrested numerous times, assaults, violent assaults. His most recent arrest was for driving while intoxicated. The officer found a loaded handgun underneath the armrest of the truck and hollow point bullets. At the time of the murder, he was on intensive, supervised parole. Shortly after the Visage homicide, Frank Thon turned himself in to serve a year in the county jail. Could there be an innocent explanation why Peter called a known violent criminal for months leading up to the murder, only to stop the day Evelyn was killed? We subpoenaed Frank Thon's phone records. Analyzing his phone records, we found that he was in the vicinity of the Visage home on January 6th, the day before the murder, and on January 7th, the day of the murder. Then it became really evident to us that he was involved in this. So now, things are starting to click. We were able to secure a search warrant to search Frank Thon's apartment. And one of the things that the police recovered was a computer. Upon forensic investigation of that computer, we found that Frank Thon had searched directions from his apartment to the Visage home. The evidence is compelling. But investigators need something more concrete to lay charges. Based on the evidence that we had, it still was a very weak case. We don't have any forensic evidence that would connect him to the murder of Evelyn Visage. You need the probable cause. You need the connection to prove your case and to actually have it stick. With little else to go on, detectives make a bold decision. We had no other option other than to go at Frank Thon. We knew our case would depend upon Frank Thon making a confession. This was really the one shot that the police had to, to solve this case. It was a huge gamble because if he decided to ask for a lawyer, they could not question him anymore. If he denied it, they were stuck with what he had to say. Police can only hope that Frank reveals the truth of whether Peter was involved in the murder. We don't have a case against Peter. We're getting closer to figuring out maybe what occurred, but again, it doesn't prove that Peter Visage had any relationship to this murder. We had nothing other than just the fact that Peter is calling Frank Thon. This case is gonna rise and fall, whether we succeed or not with an interview. 
Investigators head to the county jail to confront the hardened criminal. I specifically requested a small room where we could have the table against the wall, and we deliberately set that room up to increase Frank Thon's anxiety. We had lawyer boxes with Evelyn Visich's name on the boxes. We had maps with pin, pins in them. The small office was full of, as I call it, a number of props. With everything in place, police bring in 41-year-old Frank Thon. They took the handcuffs off him, and we pretty much just stared at him for like a good minute or two, again, in an attempt to increase his anxiety. And he was visibly nervous. And I said to him, I said, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I already know what happened, and I'm going to prove it. And I'm going to tell you what, a murder for hire in New York, you could potentially face the death penalty. We told him that we had all types of evidence implicating him, and his face hit the table. He's perspiring heavily. His heart rate was obviously increased. I could see the vein in his neck beating. And I said to him, I said, you don't have any friends in this world right now. I said, if you tell us the truth, we'll try to assist you in getting the best possible deal. There was a long pause. He took a big sigh, and then he began to tell us what happened. Four weeks after the murder of Evelyn Visage, investigators have just convinced suspected hitman Frank Thawne to start talking. He almost had a look of detachment from what was going on. He took a big sigh and he says, all right, I'll tell you guys what happened. Frank Thawne told us that he was the person who killed Evelyn. Frank Thawne confessed not only to the murder of Evelyn Visage, but that he was hired by her husband, Peter. I really was surprised after everything was said and done, after all of the investigative leads, that it all came back to Peter. Frank tells detectives that he was introduced to Peter three months ago through a mutual acquaintance. Peter asked this gentleman if he knew of anybody that could take care of his wife. Frank Thon requested $10,000 cash with $5,000 being paid up front. We later learned that Peter obtained money from a friend of a friend on a loan. A short time after that, Peter Visich met Frank Thon at a pizzeria where Peter gave Frank the down payment of $5,000 cash. I looked at the money found in the van as this could have been the final payment. To hear that for such a small amount of money that somebody was willing to go out there and kill someone, I was shocked and disgusted. In his confession, Frank describes Peter's impatience to have Evelyn killed. He told me that he had a second envelope ready. He was really pushing it. Peter Visage was pestering him to get this done, so he decided January 7th was going to be the night. Frank meets Peter at the Visage home the day before the murder. He told me to lay out of the house and I'd be able to walk to the back of the house and leave a door unlocked for me. Peter told Frank that he would uh, leave the back door open, and he gave Evelyn's uh, schedule for that day. The next day, Peter establishes his alibi. He went to his mother's house, and then the shopping mall, and then stopping to get milk. He knows that there's video cameras, you know, he knows that he's going to get a receipt. That's all adding time to his alibi that can also be substantiated. After sunset, Frank enters the Visage house and removes the light bulbs to lie in wait for Evelyn in the dark. Garage door open. Then I heard the house door open. Then I heard her coming up the stairs, and that's when I came out of the room. He had a gun. He pushed her into the bedroom, had her kneel on the bed, and he told her he was merely here to do a robbery and he wasn't going to hurt her. He said he then took a knife that he had brought with him and stabbed her twice in the back. She dropped to her knees from the bed. I she slid down. I got one there. And I took her by the forehead from behind her. Okay. I sliced in, then I sliced the back. I heard the blade. 
I recognized the sound. She dropped immediately to, to my right on the floor. I heard the air leaving her body. I stabbed her two or three more times in the chest. Do you leave the knife arm? Yes, I did. Why did you leave it? Stuck in the chest. Frank Thon was the instrument of Evelyn's death. But Peter Visage brought that instrument into his own home. On Valentine's Day, 2003, a warrant was issued for the arrest of Peter Visage. Police rushed to take Peter into custody. They said, Peter, I have very good news for you. He said, what's that? He was somewhat befuddled. I said, we found out who killed your wife. And he became like almost giggly. He's like, really, who? I said, you did, expletive. You're under arrest. It angers me and it pains me to think that the person that she married was the one that did that to her. It's shocking. It's sad. I was very surprised. Like, I was shocked. All of us were. He went through this elaborate murder. And I just thought, like, how pathetic are you as a person? Frank Thawne pleads guilty for his role in the murder of Evelyn. In exchange for his cooperation, he was promised a sentence of 20 years to life if he testified truthfully at the trial of Peter Visage. In November of 2003, in front of a packed courtroom, Peter stands trial for plotting to murder Evelyn. Evelyn's friends and family were throughout the trial present um, they had to endure really gut-wrenching testimony, particularly when Frank Thon testified. He said that he told her at the end, I'm going to put you out of your misery. And your husband was the one that, that hired me. She was just in shock. Peter Visage never takes the stand during the eight-day trial. He showed no emotion the whole entire trial. I would look at him and then just think to myself, like, why, why... Why you had to get to that point? Why did you do it? After hearing the evidence, the jury deliberates for only three hours. The jurors announced that they did have a unanimous verdict, guilty on each and every count, including murder in the first degree, which carried a life without parole sentence. We all screamed. We were relieved. And we felt like justice had been served, although it was bittersweet. It's just so hard to, to comprehend why now the child doesn't have a mom or a dad. What he did to, to Ryan is just as unforgivable as what he did to Evelyn. Because he deprived Ryan of one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met in my life. I've never met anyone like Evelyn. For those closest to Evelyn, she remains alive in their hearts. Evelyn is still here with us. She's still in our spirit. She was full of love. She was full of life. She was the life of the party. She was always happy. And if you weren't happy next to her, she will make you happy. She was a good soul. She was a good person. She will always be missed. A self-made couple making plans for the next stage of their lives. They were getting ready to have a quiet retirement. They were such a beautiful couple. They would give you your shirt off their back. They had a lot of friends and loved spending time with family. Gun down, execution style, in their own home. It just seemed to make no sense. Who would do that and what could possibly be the motive? While searching for the killer, investigators uncover a world of greed and deceit. We looked at desperation. She was desperate for money. He felt he had been treated badly, basically kicked to the curb. People were saying that he was very upset. It certainly is motive. A series of chilling discoveries. We learned that he was receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Everything he's told us is a lie. Points to a killer no one ever imagined. People were shocked. 
just shows what a messed up psyche he's got. It was unbelievable how somebody can be that cold-blooded. On the outskirts of La Crosse, Wisconsin, lies the prestigious neighborhood of Barry Mills. In early spring of 2010, this quiet community is rocked by a disturbing 911 call. 911, what is the address to David? What's in the name of the Okay, what's going on? I remember my mom and dad home. I came out to the first one. I said, I don't know. Your dad is what? Police race to the scene. First responding officers lead 40-year-old Eric Cola away from his deceased parents' home while detectives head inside. see that there was a male uh, lying on the kitchen floor. There was a large pool of blood around his head. The blood was coagulated, so it, it had been there a while. You know, it wasn't fresh blood. He was holding his car keys in one hand. He had his coat on, so it was clear that he had just walked into the door. He hadn't even set everything on the counter yet. As I viewed the male victim, the wound appeared to be a gunshot. It was near the temple of his head. Around the corner is like a hallway entryway with a computer desk, and the, the female victim was there. She was shot in the head also. Her hands are on the keyboard, and so you could see that she had been typing before she was shot. What she was typing didn't appear to be significant, but it made us believe that she had no idea that someone was behind her going to shoot her. It appeared that they ambushed them. The victims are identified as 68-year-old Dennis Cola and his wife, 65-year-old Myrna. As investigators examine the scene, they make note of other telling details. We didn't know if it was a single killer or more than one person, but you would expect more disturbance if there were more than one or that they would have overpowered the victims and that, that didn't seem to have happened. With Myrna sitting at the computer comfortably, that led us to wonder if she was the first to be killed. And her husband, Dennis, came home and he was the second one shot. There was the smell of decomposition. At that point, we weren't sure how many days earlier they were killed, but we needed to get information pretty quickly. Detectives find no sign of forced entry and no indication of any kind of struggle. The crime lab comes in. They collect fingerprints and DNA and the computer for analysis. We went upstairs and we noticed in, in the one bedroom there was a dresser that was disturbed and it appeared that it had been ransacked. What was unusual about it was the person started at the top and worked their way down with the chest of drawers. But if you did it that way, you wouldn't be able to see what was in the drawer below it. This looked like someone was trying to make it look like a burglary, but nothing seemed to be missing. And there were many other valuables in the house, including Myrna's purse and Dennis' wallet was still in his back pocket. It looked like this was staged, quite frankly. While investigators continue searching for clues, they find what could be a key piece of evidence. The bedroom had a 22 rifle in the closet. There's also a box of 22 shells on a shelf that had been moved and partially opened. That was very possibly the gun that was used in the homicides. So the gun is sent to the crime lab for an analysis. As the crime scene investigation continues, news of the murders spreads quickly through the close-knit community. When I heard about it, I thought, I can't believe this is happening. I was devastated. It hit me real hard. It was like, why would somebody kill them? Everybody loved them. 
Born and raised in Wisconsin, Dennis and Myrna Cola had been happily married for 42 years. Dennis and Myrna had a lot of friends. They had deep roots here. They had children and grandchildren, and they were very popular. I didn't hear of anyone that had anything bad to say about either one of them. From humble beginnings, Dennis rose to become a successful businessman. Dennis had graduated as a pharmacist, and he had owned a number of pharmacies and businesses throughout the years in different locations. I worked with him for two years. As a boss, he was down to earth, fantastic guy. If you needed something, he was there. He treated me like a daughter. Dennis was successful in life and in love. Him and his wife, they were always happy, having a good time. Myrna had a lot of energy. She was very sociable. Myrna was very well educated, and she was presently teaching part-time on a substitute basis. They had a good marriage. They enjoyed life. The couple had two children, their son Eric and 37-year-old daughter Cindy. Both were married with families of their own. Their family seemed pretty tight. Dennis and Myrna, they were involved with their kids and involved with their grandkids. These were parents who were very dedicated. They really wanted the best for their kids and loved spending time with family. Dennis and Myrna were getting ready to have a quiet retirement and relaxing and enjoying life. Now, those dreams have been brutally snatched away. Both shot. I would have never, never in my life expected something like this to happen. It just seemed to make no sense. We're trying to understand who would do that and what would be the motive. While police bring the Cola's son Eric into the station to get more information, investigators go door to door looking for witnesses. We start canvassing to see if anyone saw anything, uh, heard anything. Nobody in the neighborhood had seen anything suspicious. For them, it was just mostly shock. They couldn't believe that these two people had been killed. As detectives continue to search for a lead, they get their first break. One of the neighbors uh, mentioned that he thought he knew the motive and why it happened, and also the murder. He was very concerned. He believed that his life was in danger. He felt that he may be next. This neighbor, Steve Burgess, was a banker, and he thought that he may have been the intended target of the homicide. His reasoning was he had got a threatening call multiple times from a person that threatened to kill him. Coming up, new evidence emerges. The day after the homicides, he cashed his $50,000 check and never told us. And family secrets come to light. There was some jealousy, maybe bad blood between the two. Dennis always complained that he was worthless and that he didn't want to work. She had apparently lit into Dennis in a rage. Until a disturbing clue reveals a twisted plan. Someone had put this threatening note in his mailbox. Now he believes that someone was out to get him. And exposes a cold-blooded betrayal nobody saw coming. I never thought they were the kind of person that would do something like that. It was extremely unexpected. It's just chilling. Grandparents Myrna and Dennis Cola have been brutally executed in their own home. Now, one of their neighbors, banker Steve Burgess, tells investigators the killer could be coming after him. He was uh, very concerned, and he believed that um, someone was out to get him, and he didn't know who, but the homicides may have been intended for him and his family. Detectives ask Steve why someone would want him dead. So at that time, the market crashed. There was people with money issues. A lot of people came to him at the bank for loans, but they had no collateral. So people were very angry that Steve would not give them loans. The last threat was a couple of days earlier. It was a threat of violence. It certainly had to be taken serious. If Steve was the intended target, how did Dennis and Myrna end up gunned down instead? 
what he explained was a Google Earth search in front of Burgess's house showed the wrong address, showed Dennis and Myrna's address instead of his, and he thought that the killer killed the wrong people. He felt that somebody had come to his house to follow through on the threat, but they ended up at Dennis and Myrna's residence. It was a concern that this possibly could have been a mistake on behalf of the murderer, and the homicides were not intended for Dennis and Myrna. Before investigators can pursue the lead, the autopsy results arrive. The autopsy report determined that they were both shot with a 22 caliber rifle. But it was inconclusive. There wasn't enough bullet fragment left to tell if it came from the gun that we found in the house. No fingerprints were found. I mean, even from the victims, like the gun had been cleaned up. The autopsy report also confirmed that they had been deceased for a few days before the 911 call. It was likely that they were killed on that Friday. The time of death sheds new light on the threatening phone call made to neighbor Steve Burgess. We saw that call had come in Sunday morning after the Kulas were murdered. So the timeline just, it didn't make any sense. We were able to determine that the threats against Steve Burgess uh, had nothing to do with uh, the deaths of Dennis and Myrna. With their first lead a bust, detectives turned their attention closer to home. We knew Eric and his sister Cindy were very close to their parents. Eric did day trading and stuff like that, work on stocks. He was doing well. Dennis and Eric were pretty close. Some people would say like bread and butter. They'd have get-togethers all the time. Eric was the one that found the bodies. We needed the conversation with Eric for information that he might be able to provide us. Hoping he can provide details about the crime, investigators interview Eric at the station. Eric was still extremely emotional over the death of his parents. But he said he wanted to be as helpful as he possibly could and would do whatever he could to try to find who was responsible. Detectives ask how he came to find his parents had been killed. He said the school called and said that Myrna hadn't shown up for work. They called his parents and they didn't respond. So Eric tried calling and was unable to get an answer. So he called his sister and asked if she had any contact with them and she had not. He became concerned and drove over to the house. Once he walked in the house, he observed his father lying on the kitchen floor and started searching for his mom and then also found her deceased. Eric said he was extremely close to his parents. His dad, you know, supported all of his endeavors. They were just the best of buddies. We asked Eric what was the last time he had seen his parents, and he said a few days before the homicides. He visited them like he did all the time. He said his dad was working on the deck, and his mom was doing laundry. There didn't seem to be anything unusual. Investigators asked Eric where he was on the day of the murders. He said that Friday was a, he and his wife's anniversary. He had worked till two. Then he helped his buddy Mike do some work in a bathroom. They were renovating a bathroom. Eric had told us that he had gone to two stores after leaving his buddy's house looking for a specific plant that his wife liked, a hanging plant. Eric presents a receipt stamped at 6.15 p.m. After he bought the plant, he went directly home and they got ready to go out for the evening with friends to celebrate the anniversary. Eric said that he had tried over the weekend to contact his parents and wasn't able to do so. He was becoming concerned, but just thought that they were busy. When asked who might have wanted to harm his parents, Eric says they were well-liked and had no enemies. It seemed really strange, really unusual. No reason for, for the victims to be killed. Both victims killed. Before concluding Eric's interview, detectives get results back from the crime lab. The report came back indicating that the time of death based on the computer analysis was 541 on that Friday. Myrna was using the computer and the last keystroke was 541 p.m. So that gave us a timestamp that's huge. 
With the keystroke data, detectives verify Eric's alibi. We spoke to his friend Mike, and Mike said yes, Eric was here until about 5.30 uh, when he left. And he was going to go to the store. So he basically confirmed what Eric was telling us was correct. The receipt, combined with what his friend Mike said, it appeared that there wasn't enough time for Eric to commit the crime. Also, it just seemed uh, very unlikely that someone who loved his mother and father very much could be involved in, in something like this. Before Eric leaves the police station, he remembers crucial information that takes detectives by surprise. Eric had told us that his sister Cindy and her husband Pat were being financially supported by uh, Dennis and Myrna and that their dad, Dennis, told Cindy they were getting cut off financially. The uh, Friday morning of the homicides, Cindy had called Dennis. Dennis let her know that there was not going to be any more money. She became very upset. Had there been an argument over money leading Cindy to kill? That's extremely unexpected, but she did have motive. So we start looking at Cindy as a suspect. Police investigating the double homicide of Dennis and Myrna Cola believe their daughter Cindy may have been angry with her father after he cut off financial support. The two had a tense conversation just hours before the murders. When we started talking to the circle of friends and family, we were told Dennis was more than generous. He gave tens of thousands to Cindy and her husband. Cindy relied on her parents. They needed this money to pay their bills. When Dennis had told Cindy that, he was cutting her off. She didn't know how those bills were going to get paid. Detectives learn the Cola's children are set to inherit over $700,000 from their parents' death. While son Eric is known in the community as a successful businessman, Cindy's circumstances are different. Cindy didn't have much money, if any, and she was constantly asking for money because they were not making ends meet. She was working a minimum wage job or a little above that, and Pat, her husband, couldn't keep a job, would quit or get fired. They were living paycheck to paycheck and Dennis's handout to hand out. Me and Dennis would talk about Cindy at the pharmacy, and he kept telling me that he was sick and tired of supporting her every month, helping them out with their bills and stuff like that. And that Friday morning, he was very upset, and he said, my daughter called me this morning, crying on the phone, because I told my daughter that I'm cutting her and her husband off. When she would get upset, she would get just extreme, over-the-top, emotions. Cindy hearing that the cash cow was being butchered would be a reason for her to now go off the rails and it went from bad to worse. Cindy became a strong suspect. Police bring Cindy into the station for questioning. Cindy appeared broke up over the deaths of her parents but she really laid out the family dynamic. Her parents had considered her the black sheep of the family. She said that she didn't believe her parents cared about her like they cared about Eric, and she was upset with how they treated her. She told us, according to her parents, that Eric could do no wrong, and that Cindy was a disappointment and continued to be a disappointment. But Cindy denied that she had anything to do with her parents' death, even though there was this friction between them. Investigators questioned Cindy about the argument with her father the morning of the murders. Cindy downplayed the conversation she had with her father. She said just that she was disappointed her father had said he wouldn't give her any money. But it wasn't a negative conversation. Detectives wonder if Cindy is more guilty than she's letting on. There was a lot of tension between Cindy and her parents. There was disapproval there. We looked at desperation. She was desperate for money with the inheritance and given her bad feelings. All these things could lead to the fact that she may have been the one that took the lives of her parents. With suspicion swirling, police ask Cindy where she was when her parents were killed. On Friday, she was working 
and had left at 4.45. They have a time clock. She had punched out. After work, she had uh, stopped at the store. Just after 5.30, she purchased beer and ice, and then her and Patrick at a barbecue with the neighbors. Police work to confirm Cindy's alibi. She was working. That was verified then. Cindy had stopped at a quick trip, and the quick trips all have video, so she was on camera at a quick trip near her home at the time of the homicides, not anywhere near her parents. While Cindy is ruled out as the shooter, her husband Patrick comes into focus. Family and friends said that Patrick did not get along with Dennis and Myrna, and Patrick stood to inherit a substantial amount of money along with Cindy. Dennis did not like her husband at all. He told me that Cindy's husband married Cindy for the money because he knew that Dennis and Myrna had money. Dennis always complained that his son-in-law, Patrick, was worthless and that he didn't want to work. He sits and plays with the video games and he's too lazy to go find a job. Investigators dig deeper into Patrick's relationship with his in-laws. Talking to family and friends, we learned that Dennis and Myrna were upset uh, when Patrick and Cindy got married. They asked Cindy not to marry him. They felt that he lacked motivation, and they remained unhappy with him. I think the feeling was mutual. According to some reports, when there was alcohol involved, he could have been a violent person. Apparently, the uh, Friday morning of the homicides, Cindy told Patrick that they were not going to be getting any more money. People were saying that Patrick was even more angry than Cindy, that uh, they were being cut off financially. It was a large red flag. Detectives also learned Patrick had the capability to pull off an execution-style hit. Eric and other relatives were now pointing us toward Patrick, saying that he was a Marine uh, and that he knew how to handle weapons. It certainly moves Patrick up to the top of the list as far as suspects. Police hunting the killer of Dennis and Myrna Cola believe their son-in-law, Patrick Cowell, has motive for murder. Patrick was a great interest to us because he did not get along with Dennis and Myrna, and he stood to inherit a lot of money, so it certainly is motive. And Patrick was in the Marine Corps, so he would be an expert marksman. When I heard that, the police are starting to question him. I thought maybe after Dennis mentioned cutting them off, that might have triggered his son-in-law to kill them both. At the police station, detectives confront Patrick about his relationship with his in-laws. Patrick said that he was not popular in that family, that he was not comfortable with them. They weren't comfortable with him. It was kind of a cold relationship. He knew from Cindy that they were being cut off from Dennis and Myrna. He wasn't happy about it, but he denied having any involvement in the homicides. Investigators pressed Patrick about where he was at the time of the murders. He was without a job uh, at the time, and basically he spent most of his day on the sofa with uh, Xbox. We asked if he had any guns in the house, and uh, he agreed that he did. We asked if he would turn those over to us, and he said he would. As detectives wrap up their interview with Patrick, patrol officers are dispatched to collect the gun and gaming console, which are then sent on to the crime lab. The gun had been analyzed and, in fact, was eliminated as the weapon used to kill Dennis and Murda. Also, we were able to prove through the crime lab that he was on the Xbox at the time he said he was. And so that eliminated him because he was home at the time that Dennis and Myrna were killed. With Patrick ruled out, police are left scrambling for new suspects. The unsolved homicides leave the community on edge. When a crime like this happens in a small town, like Barry Mills, there's a lot of pressure on law enforcement to get it solved. People want answers. 
These aren't strangers to them. These are people they know. People in that neighborhood were fearful. You know, the closer you are to something like that, the, the more concerned you are. We were kind of scared for our lives because we didn't know why something like this would happen. Looking for new leads, investigators dig into Dennis's business connections and the wealthy pharmacist's other ventures around town. Dennis had a, a nephew, Nick Herring, who was promised a business from Dennis. They were going to open a, a car dealership together and actually did. What we understood was that uh, Nick was very familiar with uh, running car dealerships and had done a good job. Business was good, but then Dennis changed the deal. As the dealership was up and running, Dennis brought Eric, his son, in to start running it with Nick. And there was some jealousy, maybe bad blood between the two. Nick was like complaining all the time, so... Dennis had to go help out with the business. Dennis said they could not get along together, and he ended up buying Nick out. At that point, Nick was quite unhappy, and uh, there was some falling out. Tension mounted until Dennis sold the business, leaving Nick resentful. Nick lost a, a pretty substantial amount of money, so he would certainly have reason to be upset. Could Nick have harbored a deadly desire for revenge? Police bring him into the station for questioning. We spoke to Nick Herring, and he admitted that the relationship had soured. Nick had said that Dennis had given him too low amount for the business and that he got cheated out of some profit. Nick felt that he had been treated badly, basically kicked to the curb by his uncle. Despite the bad blood, Nick insists he's not involved in the murders. Nick said that it was in the past that he had started his own car dealership. He was successful and that although it was upsetting, he wouldn't hold a grudge and he had no reason to kill Dennis and Myrna. Nick said that he had worked until about 5.30. Then he had uh, picked up his girlfriend and they'd gone out to the tavern we were able to confirm that he was at work all day, and then the bartender where they were at could confirm that he and his girlfriend had spent the evening. And so we were able to eliminate him. Having ruled out yet another suspect, the investigation into the Cola murders hits a roadblock. It was very disturbing because it just seemed to make no sense. Here's a couple that are a retirement age, had a long, successful careers. For someone to come in and just murder them, it's senseless. We were still trying to understand who would do that and what would be the motive. One week after the murders, police receive news that jolts the investigation back to life. We get a call that a patrol car is being sent out to Eric Kula's residence for a suspicious item in the mailbox. Eric said that he had got a threatening letter. He was now extremely concerned that he was going to get killed. One week after Dennis and Myrna Kola are ruthlessly gunned down in their own home, Police learn their 40-year-old son, Eric, has received a threatening note. Could he be the next target? Someone had put this note in his mailbox. He was really, really concerned. This note said, fixed you. The message is kind of unusual, but Eric thought they'd killed his parents and were now going to come after him. He had no idea who would have left it or where it came from. There was an envelope, but it wasn't mailed. The handwriting looked like it was done by someone very young. It was so strange. It was probably written that way, so a handwriting analysis couldn't be done. When it comes to Eric's safety, detectives don't take any chances. We have to try to figure out what was going on. We had an investigator and a camera to watch his property. We start canvassing Eric's neighborhood to see if anyone saw anything. But with no witnesses, police are still left with no idea who placed the note. This is perplexing. We're trying to determine, was this somebody uh, local or was this someone from out of the area? 
We were very concerned. With this new potential threat, investigators cast a wider net to find the Cola's killer. But when they scoured Dennis and Myrna's computers, phones, and finances, they're surprised at what they find. We subpoenaed Dennis and Myrna's bank records and noticed that there's a check written and cashed on Dennis and Myrna's account for $50,000. It's cashed on the day after the murder, and it's made out to Eric Kula and was deposited into Eric's bank account. It seemed really strange. So you just found your parents dead, and the next day you go cash a check for 50 k It had to be looked at. Detectives reach out to Eric, hoping to learn more details. Eric's explanation is his dad gave it to him on the day that he had stopped over at his parents' house. That's very interesting because of all the conversations we had with Eric, he never mentioned this, and suddenly we have a check for $50,000, and if everything was okay, why wouldn't he tell us about it? To have a check that was deposited the day after the murders by a family member, that set off alarms for investigators. After we find that check, we look for other checks. We used a forensic accountant to uh, review Eric's finances because it was quite complicated with the day trading that he was involved in. When the accountant went through it with us and explained what we were looking at, I think we almost fell off our chairs because we had uh, no idea that this was what was going on. He told everybody that he was extremely successful with his day trading, but Eric was broke. He was day trading, but it was a myth as far as making profit. The person looking at his financials basically called BS. She told us this guy is worth nothing. He's worth about 2,000 bucks total. He was blowing smoke. Then, police uncover more startling information about Eric's financial circumstances. We learned that Eric was also going to his parents and receiving large amounts of money. Through the years, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. He led everybody to believe that he was doing so well, including his wife. Eric told her that he was making a lot of money, there was nothing to worry about, that uh, he was just doing great. Despite everyone's impression that Eric was this successful day trader, his parents had been funding his and his family's lifestyle. If he was going to have to admit that to family, friends, it was going to be devastating. Detectives learn when Dennis and Myrna stopped financially supporting their daughter, Cindy, they also cut off Eric. We knew just shortly before Dennis and Myrna were killed, Eric found out that he was no longer getting money from his parents. The damning evidence continues to pile up against Eric. Dennis told me he was giving money to Eric, but basically he was done giving to both kids. He says, I need to tell them I'm done supporting them. It's about time I put my foot down and cut them off. As investigators start to discover that Eric is not what he seems, shocking results come back from the lab. The state crime lab did a handwriting analysis on that check for $50,000. It wasn't Dennis's signature on that check. We found out that it was Eric's handwriting that he had forged his father's name on that check. Everything he's told us is a lie. So things are starting to really roll toward Eric. Police obtain a warrant to search Eric's home, hoping to find additional incriminating evidence. We're in the basement, among other things, was a box of envelopes in a desk drawer. The fix do you know had a security envelope, and every one of them has a different pattern for their security pattern. Lo and behold, those envelopes have the same pattern. We were able to determine that envelope in Eric's mailbox with the fix you note came from the box of envelopes in his home. From his fire pit in his backyard, we found things that would be associated with making a fixed you note, a spring from a spiral notebook, 
the letter was written on spiral notebook paper. A barrel of a pen used to write the address, those types of things are in the fire. So that fixed you note came from his house. It didn't look good for Eric. In the search, detectives also discover a 22 caliber rifle, similar to what police believe was the murder weapon. The gun is sent to the ballistics lab for testing. With the lies and forgery, we were pretty confident that Eric was our guy. But at that point, Eric had an alibi for the entire time that the homicides were occurring. So we we're trying to figure out how he shot Dennis and Myrna. Detectives investigating the double homicide of Dennis and Myrna Cola suspect the couple's own son, 40-year-old Eric, is the killer. But they need hard evidence to lay charges. We went out and started re-interviewing witnesses and reviewing all the evidence that we had. As detectives try to learn more details about Eric's connection to the crime, the ballistics results come back. Police wonder if the rifle found in Eric's home will prove to be the murder weapon. Dennis and Myrna were shot with a 22 caliber rifle, but Eric's gun wasn't the gun that was involved in the crime. Undeterred, detectives recheck Eric's alibi for when his parents were being murdered. The time of death based on the computer analysis was 541 on that Friday. Prior to the homicide, Eric said that he'd helped uh, his, his buddy Mike renovating a bathroom. When we originally talked to Mike, he said that Eric had left his house about 5.30, but when we re-interviewed him, he said it's very possible it could have been earlier. Once Mike's story changed, we really thought that uh, we were heading in the right direction. Investigators take a closer look at Eric's timeline. Eric had told us that he had gone to two stores after leaving his buddy's house to get a specific plant for his wife. At the time of the homicide, he had stopped at the first store, and that store didn't have it, so he had to go to the other store, got the plant, and produced a receipt. Eric's receipt is stamped 6.15 p.m. The second store is located only 10 minutes from Nicola's residence. But where was Eric at 541 when his parents were being shot? We checked with the garden center, the first one he went to, and they had plenty of those plants on the day and time that Eric said that they didn't have any. We also reviewed video footage, and he's not there, and nor is his vehicle seen coming or leaving the parking lot. So there was a window of opportunity for Eric to commit the murders. He had no alibi for the time that the computer showed that Myrna was shot. With Eric's alibi torn apart, detectives bring him in for another interview. They begin by confronting Eric about forging the $50,000 check. Eric explained that he had permission from his dad to write checks out to himself and that his dad had actually given him the check but just was too busy so told him to sign it himself. He told us I write them all the time and that that was commonplace for him to do that. It's a lie, an approvable one. He's never written one. He couldn't produce a single check that he'd ever written. He was confronted with the fixed you note and about the envelopes and that they did come from his house. With what we found and what we knew about his financials, all of those things together are great evidence. We just went down item after item after item after item. And Eric acted, in my opinion, desperate, and he wanted to leave. But Eric was no longer free to go. On July 29th, 2010, police charge Eric with the murder of his parents, Dennis and Myrna Cola. What we believe started this whole crime in motion was the fact that Eric was being cut off financially. He was desperate. Detectives piece together how the double homicide unfolded. We believe he went to see his mom at, at their home, and Myrna was sitting at the computer, and then Eric walked upstairs, got the gun that was located in the closet, came down and, and shot his mother. 
and then waited for his father to arrive. When Dennis came home, he was shot almost immediately, within seconds after he walked through that door. After the murders, Eric wipes the gun clean and returns it to the closet. Eric then took a check and said to himself, 50000 will get me through until the will is settled. After he shot his parents, he went to a garden center, bought the plant for his alibi, and went home to celebrate their anniversary dinner that night. He's as cold-blooded as a murder-for-hire man. His parents did nothing but love him and take care of him his whole life. He's a narcissistic little son of a bitch and thought that his dad owed him a living. Eric Cola's arrest stuns the community. Everyone thought that he was this golden child, that he had a great relationship with his parents, that he was this successful day trader. That he could have done this, people were shocked. I would have never expected Eric to do this. The way Dennis talked about him, always bragged about his son, and never thought he was the kind of person that would do something like that. In June 2012, Two years after Dennis and Myrna Cola were killed, a jury finds their son Eric guilty of intentional murder. His sister, Cindy, during the sentencing hearing was sobbing and she begged the judge in that courtroom to make sure justice was done that day. Eric Cola is sentenced to two consecutive life terms, plus six years for forgery. Many times I've thought about how somebody could do that, and I, I just simply can't fathom it. I guess we, we all lose a, a bit of our innocence when, uh, uh, when this kind of thing happens. Myrna and Dennis are still dearly missed by their family and friends. They were such a beautiful couple. They would give you your shirt off their back. I think of them very, very often. And my memory of Dennis is always a smiley face. I do miss him a lot. Sometimes I still think, boy, why did it have to be you? He'd still be living right now, happy life, finally retired, and joined his grandkids. And Myrna would probably still be dragging him on vacation. A vibrant and loving young mother. She was just an awesome person. She had a a little feisty side to her because of the redhead. But she was always looking out for everybody else. Is found savagely murdered inside an office building washroom. There was insulated electrical wire used to strangle her. It appeared there had been a sexual assault. Detectives pursue multiple suspects. There were problems with the marriage. They had had issues, they had been arguing. He was in the building the night she was killed. His prints matched the prints inside the bathroom stall. And hunt down an elusive killer. We talked to the attorney who states that he is probably somewhere in South America. I said, okay, where is he at? Can we get him? That no one could have imagined. I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. It was very unexpected to see him as an actual killer. Known for its live music scene, Austin, Texas is also one of the safest big cities in the country. Austin's kind of one of those cool vibe cities, and it's just a very good mix of people. There's a lot of green belts and parks and creeks and trails. It's a really, a really neat place to live. Austin has not had the kind of crime and the volume of crime as other large cities. People do typically feel safe. But in 1983, the town is rocked when a local businessman makes a gruesome discovery. In the early morning hours of September 20th, 1983, the Austin Police Department received a 911 call. 
one of the tenants of an office complex had come in in the morning and discovered things were out of place. There was a cleaning cart out in the hallway, so he went to try to find out if anyone else was still in the building. He did discover a deceased female in the upstairs men's restroom. The 911 caller did not know her name, but he recognized her as the woman who did clean the building. Police are dispatched to the scene. When we located the female victim in the men's restroom, she was positioned inside of the stall. She was undressed. There was insulated electrical wire that had small loops tied on the ends of them. Detectives believed that electrical wire was used to strangle her and be the cause of her death. It appeared because she had no defensive wounds at all that the killer came up from behind and surprised her. Everything in the crime scene suggested that this was a violent attack. There was wet toilet paper inside of her nose and her mouth. It stands to reason the killer put that in her mouth and her nose after he strangled her to ensure that she was good and dead. There was a bodily fluid and a clothing that, that made it appear as if she was drug across the floor. Her clothes were scattered amongst the, the restroom and it appeared that there had been a sexual assault. The victim was identified by an ID that was found inside of her purse. She was Lori Stout, a 22-year-old female from Austin. While forensics collect samples, investigators look for other evidence left behind by the killer. A significant fingerprint was located in the men's stall of the restroom. When dragging her in there, a person would almost have to brace themselves um, on the, the wall of the inside of the stall. The print inside the bathroom stall matched a print on the second floor fire escape. So the two of those were pretty significant. Had the killer fled through the fire escape after committing the murder? Detectives head down to the parking lot looking for more clues. They found that there was a spool that was used for insulated electrical wiring inside the dumpster. They also found some looser pieces of the same type of wiring that was used to kill the victim. Detectives bag the items for analysis. Back inside, police start piecing together a theory of who could have committed this horrible act. The fact that the victim was killed inside the building in the middle of the night suggested that whoever did this had access or a key to get in it. Detectives canvassed the building and talked to employees, but determined that no one had seen anything suspicious. We were able to talk with uh, two witnesses that saw Lori at about 12.30 a.m. as they locked up and secured the building and left. We know that she was last seen alive around 12.30 in the morning, and the employee at the building discovered her body around 8 a.m., so she died sometime during that time frame. Just as investigators are finishing up, a frantic man arrives at the scene. He identifies himself as Gary Stout and demands to know where his wife Lori is. Gary Stout told detectives he woke up that morning and discovered that his wife was not home yet from work. He got worried and he drove up to the building, which was a short distance away, and discovered her car still in the parking lot. But it was surrounded by numerous police cars. It was at that point that the police spoke with him and broke the news that his wife was found dead. He was obviously uh, traumatized by what had happened. As police take Gary down to the station for questioning, the devastating news soon spreads to the rest of Lori's family. I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. My whole world changed. I no longer had my confidant, no longer had my best friend. It was horrible horrible. When we found out that Lori had been killed, it was a big impact. It was overwhelming. Born in Arlington, Virginia in 1960, Lori Coffey was a naturally warm and caring soul. Lori was the oldest of Lori, myself, and TJ, but she was kind of the mother hen of us all. She had a, a little 
feisty side to her, and I think maybe because of the redhead. But she was always looking out for everybody else. She was just an awesome person. She really, truly was. Lori was the leader of us three musketeers, me, Beverly, and Lori. And she kept us going. After moving to Austin with her mother and siblings, in 1977, Lori met Gary Stout, who worked logistics for the military. It all flourished very fast. She was so giddy um, about Gary, and they fell in love. All in all, he just seemed like a good guy, so we were all, you know, okay, okay so this is it. After a whirlwind courtship, Lori and Gary married the following year. Three years later, Lori became pregnant. She was over the moon, very, very happy. I mean, that's what she wanted. She wanted to be married, start having a family, and she was on her way. But Lori is soon forced to face the harsh realities of military family life. Gary got orders to go to uh, Belgium. She was very sad. Lori was sad that Gary was gone overseas, and here she was facing having a baby on her own at home. On January 26, 1982, while Gary is away, Lori gives birth to a baby girl. Lori had a really easy labor, and, you know, now we have this little baby, and, uh, of course, she was ecstatic. I think that she very much enjoyed being a mother. I think that she experienced um, probably the happiest months of her life after I was born. In order to spend more time with his family, Gary left the military and took a job as a maintenance worker in the same building where Lori worked nights as a cleaner. She was very excited that he was coming home. That's all she wanted, just to be a mom and wife, homemaker. With her life finally on track, how did this loving young mother become the victim of a cold-blooded killer? As with any investigation, you have to look at those that are closest to the victim and those that have motive. As an employee of the building, a maintenance worker there, Gary had access to Down at the station, police questioned Gary about his marriage to Lori. When we asked him about any problems in their relationship, he quickly admitted that they had had issues, they had been arguing, and were unhappy. Detectives discovered that Lori actually went and stayed with her sister, Beverly, shortly before the murder happened because of a really big argument that she had with Gary. Things were not going all that well for her and Gary, and she was miserable. This definitely created a concern that there were problems with the marriage. So knowing that he has access and motive, it raises the level of suspicion that he could have been involved in this crime. Coming up, detectives uncover disturbing secrets. He wasn't happy in his relationship, and he admitted that he was looking at leaving her. Lori's family felt very strongly that he was the killer. Before a shocking tip takes police in a whole new direction. We received information from a female victim of a man that committed a similar attack against her. This is a big turning point in the investigation. Could this be a, a serial rapist? Could it be a serial murder? And has detectives risking it all to catch a killer? He knew it was going to have to be something big for us to find him. We were holding our breath. We weren't sure it was going to happen. Police investigating the murder of 22-year-old mother Lori Stout are questioning their first suspect, her husband Gary. When Gary was being interviewed, he was very forthcoming about the poor state of his marriage with Lori. So it was a little bit of a red flag. At this point in the investigation, we need additional information about problems that may be in their relationship. Lori and Gary were happy. Um, when they first got married, she was proud to be a wife. That's all she wanted. But things changed when Gary returned from overseas. Laurie wanted it to just be like it was before he left, and unfortunately, that was not the case. 
So knowing the, the family's account of their relationship as well, knowing that it was a volatile relationship that created concern that he could have been frustrated with Lori and committed this, this type of act. When detectives press Gary for details about why his marriage was falling apart, he makes an alarming confession. He admitted that he had actually had an affair and was looking at leaving Lori. Gary tells detectives that he met a woman while overseas and that she had since come to visit him in Austin. At this point, the detectives are wondering, does Gary want Lori out of the picture given the very bad state of their marriage and the fact that he wants to be with this woman he's having an affair with? Gary explains that he ultimately chose to stay with Lori, but detectives become even more suspicious after they ask him for an alibi. He stated that the night before, he and Lori had an argument, so she went and slept on the couch. At one point, she finally just got up in the early morning hours, went to work. Gary did not have an alibi that we could confirm. He was at home with a young child, asleep. He could have left his house, gone up to the building, and come back. That would not, not be something we could verify. So the marital difficulties, and now we've got a big fight, and Gary having access to the building. He's somebody that they're looking at pretty hard. Detectives ask Gary to provide samples of his blood and fingerprints to be compared with evidence found at the crime scene. He was cooperative with us. He provided uh, samples that were requested. Looking further into Gary's movements leading up to the murder, investigators reach out to his boss at the office building. The manager of the building informed the detectives that Gary had fixed a water heater uh, the day before Lori was killed. And he used the same type of electrical wiring that was used to kill Laurie. This was uh, another extremely big flag in the case. All these things together really raised the suspicion that this is the guy. As police wait for forensic testing results, Laurie's autopsy report comes in. Laurie's cause of death was, in fact, strangulation. And that seemed to match the ligature found at the scene. What was determined is that a sexual assault had taken place. They were able to get a sample of semen. However, this is 1983, so there was no DNA testing available. In order to do any comparison, we used blood type antigens. This kind of evidence is helpful in narrowing down the field of suspects. When we found out how Lori was actually killed, it was disturbing. Uh, first thought to my mind, one sick individual, one very sick individual that did it. Pure evil, absolute pure evil. Detectives eagerly receive the results of Gary's fingerprints and blood tests, but they are far from conclusive. Gary's fingerprints did not match the one inside the stall, but did match prints in the building, but he has access to the building and he is working there. His blood type it matches the type found in the semen. But of course, Gary is married to Lori, so it's another piece of evidence that can go both ways. Ultimately, we couldn't use fingerprints or, or any blood work to exclude him. Running out of options, detectives try one last method to get to the truth. Gary Stout was provided an opportunity to take a, a polygraph. During that interview, he was asked if he uh, was responsible for the murder of Lori, and he advised he wasn't. The results of that polygraph indicated that, that he was being truthful and there was no deception. Detectives were surprised that Gary passed the polygraph. Now, detectives have motive, they have access, but no evidence conclusively to show that Gary is in fact the killer. With nothing to hold him on, Gary is free to go. At this point, Gary is uh, not ruled out as a suspect, but he takes a little bit more of a backseat. Looking for new leads, investigators turn their focus back to the numerous employees who work at the building where Lori was killed. What's difficult, particularly about a public space like this, is so many people have access. We talked to everybody that uh, was a tenant in that building and started working our way through that process. Many of those folks were excluded based on fingerprints, evidence, everything else that could really put them to the side. But police learn that the building's tenants weren't the only ones who had access that night. We discovered that registration was being conducted from the University of Texas' satellite location at this office complex. 
and they stayed late after hours so that folks could come after work, sign up late into the evening. So this was uh, definitely something of interest for us. Detectives were able to get the names of the male students who had gone in that night, and they had them come down to the police department, and they got fingerprints um, of these individuals. Police process the fingerprints of over a dozen students and receive an alarming result. We were able to rule everyone out on the list with the exception of one. Um, we had a match, a fingerprint inside the uh, men's restroom as well as a fire escape door. So this person is somebody we, we want to talk to and interview. Detectives investigating the brutal murder of Lori Stout have just matched a set of crime scene fingerprints with someone who was in the building that night. The University of Texas was having a sign-up uh, registration at the satellite campus, which allowed people to come after hours uh, in the evenings after work in order to get signed up for classes. So we start going through the list of registrants. Detectives were able to determine that there was one student whose prints matched the prints inside the bathroom stall where Lori was found, and also on the fire escape door on that second floor. That individual was identified as Robert Van Wiese, and he was 18 years old. Investigators interview Robert about his movements on the night Lori was killed. He told us that he had been there for registration, and on his way out, he used the men's restroom upstairs. Once he was done in the restroom, he exited the fire escape because it was closer to where his vehicle was parked, which would explain why his fingerprints were found in the men's stall and the fire escape door. Robert Van Wieses did acknowledge that he saw the cleaning lady, which was our victim, Lori, after using the bathroom on the second floor before he exited the building. Robert tells detectives that he left the building at around 12.15 a.m. Before investigators look to verify his story, they ask Robert for a blood sample to compare to the semen found at the crime scene. Robert Van Wiese was cooperative. He gave the blood sample at the time, and the detectives submitted it for testing. There is nothing that we discover on Robert Van Wiese's criminal history or anything else that causes concern. He, it appears he's had no contact with law enforcement and no violent offenses in the past. He came from a family that is very well respected. His parents are pretty well-known surgeons in the Austin area. There didn't seem to be anything that would suggest him to behave in this kind of violent way. While they wait for the results, detectives look for anyone who can corroborate Robert's story. Detectives interviewed two employees of the education office, and they confirmed that they saw Robert Van Wiese leave the building at 12.15. We know Lori was still alive because there were witnesses that confirmed she was alive at 12.30. With Robert looking less and less like a viable suspect, his blood test results come in. The analysis of the blood sample told us that Robert was not a match to the bodily fluids found at the crime scene. The discovery means there is no hard evidence against Robert, and they are forced to let him go. Robert Van Wiese was ruled out and eliminated as a suspect. With no new leads, the investigation falters. As weeks pass with no arrests, fear in the community grows. The nature of the crime had created a lot of panic for residents, particularly females. It was difficult because there was no resolution. It left a lot of fear in the community. The police felt pressure to find out who was responsible for Lori's death. I mean, this was a totally innocent mother, 22 years old, taken from her family in a very violent attack. The people in and around that area where she was um, killed, they were interested in knowing what was going on. It was tough on our family. It is very frustrating. There's somebody out there that has taken a life, and you want that person to be held accountable. Anytime there's a crime committed like this, there's an in inherent pressure um, to solve it, to try to bring some closure and some comfort to the family and to the community. A person that could do something like this, that's not somebody that's going to stop at that one act. Typically speaking, that person is going to continue to hurt other people. 
we're always worried that you know he could he can continue to commit these kind of acts until he's brought to justice. One month after Lori's murder, police receive a promising new lead. We received information um, from a female victim of a man that committed a similar attack against her. The victim was sexually assaulted and strangled, but she was able to get away. He mistakenly thought she was dead, and uh, she was able to identify him. That person's name was Daryl Kemp. Daryl Kemp at that point was in prison, but he was not in prison at the time that Lori was killed. And so we started looking into this. We evaluated the information and started to determine if this could potentially be a suspect in, in this case. Police dig into Daryl Kemp's background and discover a disturbing pattern. It's determined that Daryl Kemp committed a attack in 1960, um, similar where the, the victim was uh, sexually assaulted and strangled. He was convicted for the rape and murder of a woman named Marjorie Hipperson in California. He did receive the death penalty for that. But later on, the death, death penalty got overturned. Ultimately, he was released and paroled in 1978. That's when Daryl Kemp moved to Boston. His M.O. matched. He's killed in this fashion before, and he was in Austin at the time. So this is going to be somebody that detectives look at pretty intently. Could this be a, a serial rapist? Could it be a serial murder? We had questions that we needed to get answers to. One month after young mother Lori Stout was found raped and murdered in a bathroom stall, police are investigating a tip that she was the victim of convicted serial killer Daryl Kemp. Detectives at this time were, were thinking that Daryl Kemp was a, a strong possibility as a suspect because of the similar M.O., which was sexual assault and strangulation. Investigators learn that although Daryl is currently in jail for an unrelated crime, he was a free man at the time Lori was killed. Detectives head to prison to question him. The difficult part about interviewing somebody like Daryl Kemp is he's obviously been down this road before. He's got knowledge of how investigations work, and so information may be withheld or may not be genuine in his responses based on where he thinks or feels like your questions are leading him. Detectives start by questioning Daryl about where he was around the time of Lori's murder. They're asking him questions that would help tie him or connect him to the area that the building was located in. They asked if he knew where this building was, where he lived, basically to try to put him in a geographical area, figure out where he frequented. Daryl tells investigators he wasn't near the office building where Lori was killed and has no ties to the area. Daryl Kemp was asked if he was familiar with Lori Stow. He said he wasn't. Things that we're trying to pay attention to is whether his statements are truthful, does his body language support his statement, does it appear he's being deceptive, and is he forthcoming with his answers. Not trusting the word of a convicted killer, detectives shift gears. He was asked if he would take a polygraph. He hesitated with that because he didn't trust polygraphs. He is not cooperative at all. It's the same story when investigators ask him for his fingerprints and a blood sample. Again, he was very uncooperative. Based on all the evidence collected, we had enough information to obtain a warrant. Police collect Daryl's samples and eagerly wait for the results. When the results of the analysis were, were returned, it was determined that he was not the suspect in, in this murder. It's very difficult and frustrating because we're at a stalling point again. With no other leads, the case once again hits a wall. As the months turn into years, Lori's loved ones struggle with the lack of closure. Why are we not getting any answers? You know, give us something. I myself have been lost without her. Every time October 1st rolls around, first thing I think is, oh, it's Lori's birthday. Anytime when September comes around, when she was taken from us, it was, it's, it's not good. The suspicion that Lori's husband, Gary, was the killer continues to linger and causes a deep divide. My mother's family, even members of his own family, believed that my dad was involved. We all still had that suspicion that Gary had something to do with it. 
Eventually, Gary takes Dale and moves out of state. Gary, he didn't want to have anything else to do with us. So it was like, oh my God, now we can't see Dale. I lost my sister, but I also lost that connection with my niece. Being so young, she didn't really remember her mom. So it's probably, it's probably quite hard on Dale. When I was growing up, there weren't a whole lot of conversations about my mother. It was just the understanding of she wasn't there anymore. As Dale grows older, she begins to ask questions. My dad did not like talking about it. I did not have a family member sit me down and explain to me that this is what had happened to her. It wasn't until I got older, got access to the internet, that's when I learned that she was attacked, that she had been strangled, that she had been raped, and then she had been murdered. It was very overwhelming finding out about it in that way. Lori's family continues to push for her killer to be brought to justice. We never gave up hope. We tried um, to keep it fresh and focused on it. We were constantly checking in. We had to get this case closed to help give our family a little peace. It just, it was overwhelming. The pressure finally pays off. And in 1992, nearly 10 years after Lori's murder, a new team of detectives reopen her case. Now we have new eyes looking at everything. They look at the crime scene photos. They read all the police reports. They look at the various people that were interviewed. Part of that process is to go back and look at, at old evidence. Are there things now that are available to law enforcement that weren't previously available? Is there testing that can be done? Now we're in 1992, so we have DNA testing, which is much more powerful. With that in mind, investigators revisit their prime suspect, Lori's husband, Gary Stout. So Gary was contacted again and provided a, a DNA sample, which was compared to that obtained at the crime scene. Police are hopeful that they'll finally have the evidence they need to make an arrest. But when the results come back, they are shocked at what they reveal. It was determined that Gary was not a match. So officially, he could be ruled out as a suspect and remove the cloud of doubt that had been hanging over his head for some period of time. I do believe that my father felt relief, but it was very difficult for him to talk about. With Gary cleared, cold case detectives go back over the old files, line by line. With any review of a case, you look at um, who's been interviewed, who's been eliminated. And what was discovered is that one of the reports that was provided as far as the blood typing uh, seemed to have an error. The documentation that was used to finalized the forensic report that excluded a suspect actually showed that there was a clerical error in that lab report. And that particular suspect should have been included as a suspect, not excluded. This is a big turning point in the investigation. Ten years after wife and mother Lori Stout was savagely murdered, cold case detectives have unearthed a stunning error in the results of a blood test that means a previously cleared suspect might not be innocent after all. What was discovered is that the report said the subject could be eliminated, but there was a clerical error in the document and it should have read that he could not be eliminated. This suspect is Robert Van Wiese the 18-year-old University of Texas student. He was in the building the night Lori was killed, registering for a class, and he's the same person whose prints were found inside the bathroom stall and also on the second floor fire escape door. Detectives look into what Robert Van Wiese had been doing the last 10 years. Robert Van Wiese had no criminal history. Here we have this 18-year-old college student Coming from a well-to-do family, parents who are professionals seem to have a very normal, happy upbringing. He was cooperative. So that all combined with the report that we received, you know, naturally excluded him as a suspect. Could 18-year-old Robert really have committed such a brutal crime? 
in talking with witnesses, Robert Van Wiese is seen about 12.15 a.m. and leaving at about 12.30. They see Lori in the building uh, by herself. Detectives re-examine the fingerprints he left at the crime scene and notice something troubling. What they discover is that his story of exiting the building through that second floor fire escape door would naturally support fingerprints being left on the inside of that door as if you're pushing it open to leave. But some prints of his are found on the door handle on the exterior of the door as if you're opening it to enter the building. What this told us is that he had obviously left the building, but he'd also come back in. He would have been able to re-enter it through that same door if he had propped it open with something. The discoveries mean investigators need to talk to Robert, but there's a problem. We try to locate uh, Robert Van Wiese, but we're not able to. And we reach out to family members who are not cooperative. They provide an attorney's contact. Uh, we talk to the attorney who states that Robert Van Wiese is probably somewhere in South America. All evidence up to that point showed he was in the Austin area. And then he likely finds out that he once again is a suspect. And now we have DNA testing capability. So he flees. Fearing Robert has left the country, detectives scramble to find him. They interview dozens of his friends and family members, but no one is willing to cooperate. Before they can launch an all-out search, detectives still need more proof that Robert's the killer. So they come up with a plan to obtain his DNA. With Robert Van Wiese having fled, uh, we cannot get a sample from him. But what we are able to do is get what's called YSTR testing accomplished. And that's familial DNA, and it's specific to the Y chromosome that all brothers and fathers would share. So since Robert Van Wiese has brothers in the Austin area, that's something we can actually test. In order to obtain the sample, detectives conducted uh, surveillance with family members, and at one point, they observed one of the brothers discard a, a trash and retrieve it. Trash is not something you need to get a search warrant for because it's what's deemed abandoned. So detectives take specific items that would gather DNA evidence, like razor blades and toothpicks, and they conduct YSTR testing. When the DNA tests come back, the results are conclusive. And lo and behold, it's a match. Finally, we're able to make a direct connection with Robert Van Wiese to the DNA found at the crime scene. It was surprising to know that a young male coming from the background that he did had the ability to do this at such a young age. There were no red flags with him. And so it was very unexpected to see him as the actual killer. We finally had a name. It just totally broke down. And so you're trying to wrap your head around, how could an 18-year-old do something like this? It was shocking because I was 18 myself at the time. I would have never have had that cross my mind. I said, OK, where is he at? Can we get him? And then that's when we learned that he was gone. Robert Van Wiese is charged with murder and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution and a warrant is issued for his arrest. Investigators team up with the FBI and launch an international manhunt. The Van Wiese family owned a lot of properties throughout Mexico. We conducted telephone toll analysis. We looked at financial records. We monitored travel of Van Wiese's family. We did a tremendous amount of ground surveillance on locations where we thought he might be. There were some tips that the FBI received or sightings of Van Wiese in Mexico in certain locations, but we weren't successful in locating him. Years pass with no sign of Robert, but detectives refuse to quit. All you want to do is bring the guy back so he can face justice and get some kind of closure for the victims. But even the FBI, we have limited access, limited resources, and Mexico is a big country. There's plenty of places for him to hide. It is very frustrating because for me, I've lived my entire life waiting for justice, but also very cognizant of the fact that it may never happen. Then in 2016, the hunt for Robert Van Wiese takes a promising turn. Van Wiese had been on the run for 20 years, so I knew it was going to have to be something big for us to find him. And so we discussed it and we said, look, 
Let's do it. Let's go for it. On December 13th, 2016, the FBI places Robert Van Wiese on their top 10 most wanted list. This was huge for our case because it brings awareness, but also that comes with a $100,000 reward. So it was, it was exciting to know that we're making traction. Once we announced his addition to the FBI's 10 most wanted list, we again interviewed people that knew him and possibly knew where he was. Probably the most important interview was with Van Wiese's mother. We said, Robert is going to be arrested. He is coming home. The safest way is to turn himself in. I think the mother realized with the $100,000 reward, his name on the 10 most wanted list, that it was going to be insurmountable that he was going to get arrested. The pressure pays off, and a phone call comes in that changes everything. Robert Van Wiese's attorney contacted the district attorney's office to let them know that he wants to turn himself in. Thirty-three years after the murder of Lori Stout, her elusive killer, Robert Van Wiese, is ready to return to the U.S. to face justice. Robert Van Wiese's lawyer contacted the district attorney's office and started to inquire about possible surrender with a plea bargain agreement. Typically speaking, when someone is a fugitive, we do not negotiate. But circumstances in this situation are quite unique. Mexico will not agree to extradite to Texas if the death penalty is on the table. So we will not get him in our hands if he's arrested in Mexico unless we agree to not have death penalty on the table. Wanting a swift resolution, the district attorney negotiates a deal. Bain Luisi would agree to turn himself in, and they agreed to um, 30 years in prison. On January 26, 2017, police head to the Mexican border to meet Robert. The plan was for him to surrender, but we were holding our breath. We weren't sure it was going to happen. We're anxious that this is finally going to take place, but until we have Robert Van Wiese in, in physical custody, we can't let our guard down. The arrangement was that he would meet us at the halfway point on the pedestrian bridge. There's a line in the middle. On one side says Mexico, on the other side says United States. He was to meet us there at 1 o'clock. Um, he didn't show up. As the minutes tick by, investigators start to worry they've been duped. We had assurances from the attorney that he would show up, but at any point during that time, he could have turned around and changed his mind, and there was nothing we could have done. At 1.36 p.m., a lone figure approaches the border. He walked up very slowly, stopped at the line. He introduced himself as Robert Van Wiese, and I said to him, you ready to turn yourself in? He took a deep breath, he closed his eyes, he said yes, I said step on across, and he took one step over and he was arrested. Seeing him walk across that bridge and seeing law enforcement put handcuffs on him, it was extremely satisfying. There had been so much work from so many different people over the years, that from 1983 up until 2017, now we have somebody that's accountable and be brought to justice was one of the uh, most rewarding experiences in my career. I sent the picture to Dale and let her know we got him. And I, I get a text back that it apparently was Dale's birthday. So it was pretty emotional. She showed me a photo of Van Wiese being escorted into custody. It's kind of hard to believe that after all of these years that it would be that day of all days that he would turn himself in. It was, and it still is surreal that it finally did happen. I mean, it just emotions everywhere. I just can't, it's, it's finally over. It's finally over. Finally over. The plea deal means Robert does not have to speak to investigators leaving them to piece together how they believe the murder unfolded. He showed up that night to register for classes. He sees Lori as she's cleaning. It's possible that Robert Van Wiese and, and Lori Stout had an interaction as he passed her. Maybe she spoke to him. He goes to the bathroom, develops his plan on coming back in. 
he's opportunistic and the opportunity rose and he left through that fire escape door on the second floor, propped it open. And once the other workers had all left, I think he came back in. When he came back in, he would have passed in the parking lot the dumpster that had some leftover electrical wiring that Gary Stout had used that day for the hot water heater and grabbed it and went upstairs and then attacked her, raped her and killed her. Lori was killed in probably one of the most personal violent ways that someone can be killed. Robert Van Weese is an extremely cold and calculating person. On March 28, 2017, Robert pleads guilty to Lori's murder and is sentenced to 30 years in prison. Lori's sister, Beverly, is there to deliver an emotional impact statement. I looked him right in the eye and told him what he had taken from our family and what it had done. And, uh, you know, I just told him I hope he rots in hell and gets to feel some of that terror that my sister felt that night. I know in my heart he is where he needs to be. I think Lori's family felt a sense of relief, a sense of closure that maybe now, at least my hope for them now with that is that they could at least start to heal. Him being arrested and incarcerated does bring closure. I think that that's what everybody dreams about when a crime like this happens to one of their family members. Still see Lori's face quite often. She was a hoot. Lori was a hoot. I miss her dearly. I do believe that my life would have been very different if she would have lived. And I know that she would have done anything to make sure that I had what I needed. I still think of Laurie every day, every single day. There were a lot of good times, good memories with Laurie. Um, and I just wish we would have had more. A devoted mother of four. She was just the ultimate mom. She always wanted the best for all of us. Vanishes without a trace. There was just no explanation for why she would be gone. I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. Investigators are sent down a rabbit hole of suspects. He said that the subject will never be found. My mom did not have an enemy in the world other than him. He disliked Patricia Kimmy. He hated Patricia Kimmy. He wished harm to come to Patricia Kimmy. And discover grisly clues. We found Patricia Kimmy's dentures. We did find blood in the back of the truck. And a money clip that was soaked in blood. Until a shocking revelation. She told investigators she knew where Patricia Kimmy was changes everything we were shocked that's one of the most evil things you can do horton kansas a tiny farm town deep in america's heartland horton's a town of several hundred people it's kind of a quiet town. Overall, there's not a lot of crime. Horton is a rural area surrounded by cornfields. Everybody knows everybody. It's just a typical Midwest small town. One fall day in 2009 turns into a nightmare when a daughter and son learn their mother, Pat Kimmy, has gone missing. That Saturday... I got a phone call from my mom's best friend. And when I answered it, she said that she was concerned about my mom because they were supposed to go on a shopping trip that day and my mom had actually never answered her calls. I knew that was very strange. I jumped in my truck and went out there to my mom's house. Her jacket was in the kitchen. Her purse was sitting there and her phone, everything was there but her. 
Very quickly after my brother Tony arrived and said, you need to call the sheriff, this is not right. Mom, she did not go anywhere without her cell phone. It was in her pocket 24-7. So that was an immediate flag right there that something was wrong. I can't explain the fear over that because there was just no explanation for why she would be gone. Alarmed, Rita and Tony call 911. A sergeant arrives at the house at 9.45 a.m. He immediately notices troubling signs. On the front porch, there was a wooden gate that went across this staircase. And this gate had been broken in half and had been pushed off the porch. I noticed that the door was standing open, but the deadbolt lock was out. A rug in the front door foyer was messed up as well, and it appeared to me that maybe there was some type of struggle. I immediately treated it as a crime scene. Investigators head to the scene in search of clues as to what could have happened to Pat Kimmy. The house was well arranged. There was no sign of really anything inside the house that had been disturbed. There was a computer that had been left on. The investigators were able to tell from looking at the computer the time of the last keystroke. It was like 7, 7.01 the night before was the last stroke on the computer. So we believe she was on the computer when maybe there was a knock on the door. Detectives look for clues outside the home. We found Patricia Kimmy's car and car keys were at the home. Obviously, she did not leave with her own vehicle, so she must have left with somebody else. We also had discovered several droplets of blood on the gravel rock portion of the driveway. After we looked at all the stuff, the door and the broken gate, the blood in the driveway, our thought process was she's been kidnapped. At that point, we still were considering a missing person. Maybe she was taken by force. Police break the hard news to the family that they believe Pat has been kidnapped or possibly even a victim of foul play. We had hope we're going to find her. But when they found the blood, it was just your heart sank. Who took her out of her home and what did they want with her? And I just leaned over and said, Rita, do you think she's coming back? And Rita got tears in her eyes and said, no, I don't believe she is. Born in Kansas in 1951, Pat's youth was full of joy. She was a very big farm girl at heart. She grew up on a farm. She loved animals and always wanted to be a veterinarian. In her late teens, Pat fell in love. My mom met my father, Eugene Kimmy, in high school, so they started dating. Nobody loved him like she did. In 1971, Pat and Eugene got married. Eugene ran the Kimmy sawmill he had inherited, while Pat was a devoted stay-at-home mom to their four kids. There wasn't anything that meant more to her than her family. She was just the ultimate mom. She always wanted the best for all of us. As the years passed, cracks started to appear in Pat and Eugene's marriage, and the relationship crumbled. Eugene was very controlling. To him, she couldn't do anything right. He didn't want her going anywhere. He wanted her to stay at home. In 2008, the couple called it quits. Following the divorce, I could see a difference in my mom. And I think there was a sigh of relief to her that she could finally live life freely instead of being under the thumb of Eugene. Now, all that is left is a trail of blood and a list of unanswered questions. As news of her disappearance spreads, the community unites in their search for Pat. We got as many people together as possible. We lined up and we started walking, looking for any signs of Pat. Pat was very well loved in the community. It was obvious from the support that the community gave us. Hundreds of people came out 50 feet apart, spread walking through the fields. It gave you chills to see something like that. 
While the search continues, detectives ask Pat's kids if there was anyone who might have wanted to hurt their mom. Rita and I both looked at each other and then looked back at him and I said, Eugene Kimmy is the only one we know of. My mom did not have an enemy in the world other than him. As investigators learn more about Eugene, a disturbing picture begins to emerge. He was often drunk. A lot of times he was very argumentative and his drinking was never under control. The descriptions I received from everyone was that he drank too much, that he was just a very unpleasant person. My mom found out that Eugene had cheated on her and that was something that truly broke her heart. All of us told her to get out. Nobody should have to put up with that. So that's when she decided enough was enough. Pat divorced Eugene a year before she went missing. Mrs. Kimmy ended up getting the property from the divorce. Pat had won a very large settlement with the alimony payments being made. There was a huge payment going out every month to the sum of about $2,300. So he was bitter about that. Eugene said it was unfair, was constantly complaining to everyone the amount of money he had to give her, and Eugene didn't think she was entitled to anything. Detectives also learned Eugene had made sinister remarks about his ex-wife. People in the community told us that he had made comments about how he wished she was dead. He was constantly saying that he wanted her gone. He had actually been telling people that he would like my mom to just disappear. Was Eugene so enraged at the divorce that he followed through on his threats? I don't think there was much question in anybody's mind of who had a motive to harm Patricia Kimmy. Coming up, investigators uncover a web of alarming secrets and lies. You could tell that the woman was filled with guilt. He lied in every interview. Why did he do this if he wasn't involved in this case? His story, it changed every time. While family descend into despair. We were all very fearful at that point. I knew it was not going to turn out good. Before the truth blindsides everyone. She was fighting for her life, kicking on that ground. You really couldn't make up a case like this. It's been 24 hours since Pat Kimmy has mysteriously disappeared from her home in Horton, Kansas. And the signs point to foul play. Police already have their first suspect, Pat's ex-husband, Eugene Kimmy. He was upset about the divorce settlement, and he made it very clear that he disliked Patricia Kimmy. He hated Patricia Kimmy. He wished harm to come to Patricia Kimmy. And he would tell that to anybody that would listen to him. Had Eugene finally made good on his threats? Detectives question him at the Kimmy Sawmill. Eugene Kimmy denied that he was involved with Patricia's disappearance. He said, yes, I'm upset after the divorce, but he says I would never harm her. Evidence at the crime scene indicates Pat was abducted around 7 p.m. So investigators ask Eugene where he was during that time. He said he went to sell logs that day. He came home, he ate supper alone, and then later on he turned a movie on on TV and watched it until he fell asleep. And so he really had no one that was with him at any time during that period that could vouch for him. Unable to rule Eugene out, police obtain a warrant and search his home and sawmill, but find no evidence to tie him to Pat's disappearance. We had nothing concrete to put him anywhere near the scene. There was no evidence of anything to put Eugene at Miss Kimmy's house that night. 
Eugene Kimmy is put on the back burner. As the search for Pat continues, a telling discovery is made about a quarter mile from her house. One of our deputies located a camouflage baseball cap. It was just out among the weeds and it seemed out of place. It had a writing on the front that said Sailor's Insurance Company. I instructed him to photograph it and collect it as evidence. Knowing there had been heavy winds in the area overnight, investigators expand their search and find more evidence just a half mile west. They find a money clip that had some U.S. currency attached to it, and that currency was soaked in blood. We found a bag containing some rifle shells that had blood on it. There was coins on the roadway that had blood on them. All these items was collected and sent for DNA testing. And then just to the east of that, there was a area in the grass that kind of been pushed down. They noticed that the grass was matted down in an area about the size of a person, which led them to believe that a person had been on the ground in that location. And then as they examined that closer, they began to find blood drops. That was when they knew we have a second crime scene. Because of the blood on the money clip, the blood on the coins, the activity in the grass that had blood on it. We knew something significant happened at that scene. I and Larry both thought, this is not good. We were hoping to find her, but uh, I just knew this is not going to have a good resolution. Police unearthed one more chilling piece of evidence down the road. Law enforcement called me telling me we just found Patricia Kimmy's dentures. And I was asking them, well, how in the world do you know they're Patricia Kimmy's dentures? And they said, because her name is printed on the inside of them. And it clearly was her dentures. I don't think anybody doubted that there had been foul play. When we found the dentures with her name on them, we all thought that, yeah, this is probably a homicide now. The grisly discovery forces Pat's family to face a grim reality. We knew that she had been there, and that something really awful had happened to her. My heart just sunk, because I, then I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. While the roadside evidence leads back to Pat, nothing points to a killer until an officer sees something close by. There was a receipt found. The receipt had a date and time stamp on it. It was uh, dated November the 6th, the night of Patricia's disappearance. It was from a Walmart store in Hiawatha. We was able to go up and, and track down who the person was that done this transaction. Police bring the customer, a local teen, down to the station. We asked him what he was doing in the area, and he said he went out there with his girlfriend. They were sitting there under the stars, had a cooler, left the area, forgot to put the cooler in the vehicle. And he had returned to that location to retrieve his cooler. He was able to then describe seeing a very unique vehicle in the area that was stopped along the side of the road in the vicinity of Mrs. Kimmy's home. And that vehicle was unique because it was a red pickup truck that had dual wheels on the back. What the teen tells police next leaves them stunned. He also described that as he drove past that truck on the side of the road, he could see what he believed was a pair of legs in the deep grass and that those legs were possibly kicking as if someone was laying on their back in the grass and kicking their legs. We all thought that, yeah, someone was fighting for their life. And as close as it was to Mrs. Kimmy's house, we immediately thought, well, that was probably Pat on the ground. It was a good break. And it was something that we knew we were going to have to start focusing on and find out who was capable of kidnapping and murdering Patricia Kimmy.
Investigators working the no-body homicide of mother of four, Pat Kimmy, have found a witness who might have seen a roadside attack the night Pat disappeared. He was out with a girlfriend, and on the north side of the roadway, about where the items were found that had the blood on them, he saw a red dually pickup. He said that there was someone on the ground kicking. He didn't really see anything other than that, and he left the area. I think at that point he was young. He was scared of what was going on, and really, I don't think he knew exactly what to do at the time. There was no reason for him to be making that story up and put himself at that location when he didn't need to. So his story was pretty believable. The gal that he was with, we talked to her. He had accounts for everything that he had done that evening. His girlfriend backed up what he said, so we had no reason to believe him of being a suspect. If that truly was Pat Kimmy in the grass, detectives know it's imperative to identify the driver of the red Dooley truck. To have a description of a red Dooley pickup was really a strong lead. A Dooley pickup truck is a pickup with dual tires on the back of it. My first thought was, we've got a potential suspect vehicle that we need to start looking for. As police search ownership records for red Dooley trucks, they received the forensics report from the crime scene. The DNA on the sailor insurance hat was found to be that of a male. Investigators were able to obtain DNA off of the sweatband on the inside of that sailor ball cap. But you can't just take DNA and say, whose is this? You need a comparison. No match is found in the criminal database for the ball cap DNA, but other evidence is more conclusive. The money clip, the coins, the blood on everything found at the second crime scene, all was that of a profile that matched a female. And so we were able to get the DNA and be able to positively identify that blood as belonging to Patricia Kimmy. While the results are encouraging, detectives still don't have a body or a primary suspect. Then, a week after Pat vanished, her daughter Rita remembers something. I was just thinking about my mom and and pulled up her picture to look at on the computer. And there was a memory I had of her talking about a man who had worked on her house. His name was Dane. Mom had a contractor at her house, Dane Deweese, and she had some work and she had to call him back a couple times because she wasn't satisfied with it. Pat had had a contractor from Abilene, Kansas come up and do some work on her fireplace. And she had some disagreements with the contractor that something wasn't correct. So I got to thinking about that and pulled him up on the computer, and he had a police record. So that was very concerning. Just thinking about the fact that he had been around her, he had access to her home. And what really raised the flag with him is when we found out he drove a red pickup. Well, we're on to something now. Could Pat and Dane have gotten into an argument about his work, causing him to violently lash out at her? Rita alerts police about Dane, and they immediately bring him in for an interview. He was very cooperative, told us that, yes, he has a red dually pickup. He told us that he had done some work for Patricia Kimmy's house. He was honest in telling us that she was not happy with some of the work. He volunteered to come back and fix those items, which he did, and had thought he had settled everything with her. He thought Pat was a very good person to work for, He said he got it corrected, and Pat was very appreciative that he got it corrected, and he said that he thought that everything was okay between him and Pat and that he would never harm Pat. Mr. DeWeese did not really have an alibi. He had nothing to back up his whereabouts for the night before. 
he told the investigators he was at home alone, but he didn't have anybody that could vouch for that. And he quickly became our prime suspect. He allowed us to search the truck, which we did. When investigators search Dane's truck, they make a disturbing discovery. We did find blood in the back of the truck. We were a little alarmed when we saw the blood in the back of Mr. Deweese's truck. Could it be Pat Kimmy's blood? And could this be the evidence that blows the case wide open? This looked like a very serious matter and indicated that he perhaps was the person involved. And the blood in the back of the truck really made it suspicious. It's been a week since Pat Kimmy was abducted and likely killed. Police suspect contractor Dean DeWeese is involved and have found incriminating evidence in his vehicle. In the pickup, we did find blood in the back of the truck. Mr. DeWeese volunteered that he had recently been hunting for deer and there might have been some blood and fur left in the back of the bed. We took samples from the truck of the blood to confirm his story. Detectives rushed the samples for DNA analysis. They were able to determine the blood actually was from a deer and it was not human blood. After that, we searched down everything we could for Dewey's and never could find out any information that he was even in the area of Pat Kimmy. So we had to eliminate him. It was hard to take at the time. We really thought we were onto something with the Dooley pickup, but there wasn't enough to go forward with. It was very disappointing. Right back to square one we go. With no new suspects, investigators focus on finding the owner of the red truck and the sailor insurance hat found on the side of the road. We talked to the sailor insurance company to get a list of people that would potentially have access to a sailor hat. Investigators were able to get a customer list and find a list of possibilities of a red Dooley pickup insured by sailor insurance. Detectives asked Pat's family if they recognize anyone on the list. They had us go down through the list and Roger Hollister's name stuck out. He's bought lumber at the sawmill before. They said Roger Hollister had done business with Eugene Kimmy and that Roger Hollister drove a red dually pickup. Roger Hollister was reported to be somewhat of a hothead, the kind of a person who got upset a lot, the kind of a person who could be violent. He was not well liked, not a nice guy and it, it was a major red flag for us. Believing Roger could be a major suspect, detectives rushed to the Hollister farm to interview him. We were able to contact Mr. Hollister at his house. He was wearing a neck brace. He was walking with a cane. We thought, he's a frail old man. There's no way he could be involved in this. Roger Hollister told investigators that he knew Eugene Kimmy taken logs over to be processed at the sawmill. But he had never been to Pat's house. He didn't know Pat. He denied any knowledge at all of the disappearance of Patricia Kimmy. Detectives ask Roger about the ball cap and the Dooley truck. Roger was very cooperative. He said that he did have a sailor insurance kit, but it got tore up by his dog. And he said, yes, I had a, a red Dooley pickup but he told us he sold that truck to a guy by the name of Rick for $2,000 before Pat disappeared. Investigators ask Roger to account for his movements the night Pat was abducted. He said that he'd been at his home the whole night. His wife left late evening hours and drove to Kansas City to be with her daughter. And he was home alone the whole time. Even though Roger had owned both a sailor insurance hat and a dually truck, Detectives don't believe he's their guy. We did have some doubt that 
Mr. Hollister could have been the person that done this because he had a neck brace on. He could barely walk. And they said he appears to be so physically challenged, we don't think that he would really even be capable of dragging someone out of their home and hurting them. At that point, we didn't think that Mr. Hollister could have been involved in this case. Detectives dismiss Roger Hollister as a suspect. A month has passed since anyone last saw Pat alive, and investigators are no closer to locating her killer or her body. There was a lot of pressure to find Patricia Kimmy. The investigative team wanted to find her. The family wanted to find her. The whole community wanted to find her and get justice for Patricia Kimmy. It was getting frustrating thinking that we might never find her, never get this case solved. Two months into the case, police catch a break when Pat's son Tony and nephew DJ show up to the police station with shocking new information. They told us that Roger Hollister went over to the Kimmy sawmill And he wants to talk to Eugene, but Eugene wasn't there. The employee at the sawmill, DJ Kimmy, told the investigators that Roger said to him, tell Eugene, I'm here to collect, I want my money. And DJ says, I don't have your money. I don't know what you're talking about. And Roger then said he had taken care of it in reference to my mom. And he said, Well, I'm just here to recoup my money that I took care of the subject. And he also stated that the subject will never be found. It was a major break in the case. We were on to something now. Police are investigating the disappearance and homicide of 58-year-old Pat Kimmy. Now, two months into the case, they've learned from Pat's family that Roger Hollister has come looking for money, claiming he got rid of Pat. When Roger said, the subject will never be found, referring to my mom like that, we were all very fearful at that point. Pat's nephew, DJ, tells police he remembers he saw Eugene and Roger talking at the Kimmy sawmill one day. We believe that maybe Eugene was drinking, did not like the situation he was in with his wife, and maybe he made a comment to Roger, said he wanted to do away with his wife. As we confirmed, there was numerous comments made to numerous people to that effect. He didn't like the divorce settlement, lost land, He was making alimony payments. That's a strong motive for murder. So our thought process was maybe he was drunk and maybe Eugene told Roger, I'd pay somebody to get rid of my wife. Despite having previously ruled Eugene out, police circle back and check his finances for any evidence of a payout. Law enforcement went through Eugene's bank records and there was no activity on his checking account. We saw no indication that money was actually paid out. We executed a search warrant on the sawmill of Eugene Kimmy, but we really didn't find anything that would substantiate Eugene's involvement in the case. Undeterred, detectives focus on tracking down the red dually truck Roger had once owned initially told us that he sold that truck to a guy by the name of Rick for $2,000. We searched a VIN number for a pickup belonging to Roger Hollister, but it was not put in the name of anybody by the name of Rick. And we found out that the truck was actually sold to a dealership in Tecumseh, Nebraska. Investigators learned that Roger bought the truck back from the dealership 12 days after Pat went missing. He lied about his truck being sold, Why did he do this if he wasn't involved in this case? When police bring Roger to the station for another interview, they cannot believe their eyes. He was not the same person as he had been. The first interview with Roger, he wore the neck brace, he walked with a cane. But now he comes through that door like 
there was nothing wrong with him whatsoever. We were very shocked. I don't think anything at all was wrong with Roger Hollister. I think he just was using that as a front for everything that was going on. Anytime a suspect is untruthful with you, that just makes them look all the more suspicious. Roger tells police he went to the sawmill to buy lumber and denies speaking to Eugene or DJ about Pat or any money. But when pressed about the truck, his story changes. Roger said that he'd sold it to a group of Mexicans that were passing through the area. He did not know their names or anything about them. That sounded fabricated. His story, it changed every time. With suspicion growing, detectives ask Roger for a DNA sample. When the results come back, the news is conclusive. We found out that the DNA on the sailor insurance hat belongs to Roger Holster. That was a very big moment because now we know that he was at that crime scene because his DNA is found there. We knew he was involved. Detectives now have enough probable cause to serve a search warrant on Roger's farm. We took a track hoe out there and we was able to pick things up, dig around. And what was found was parts of the truck. A lot of the stuff had been buried and it has been burnt pretty severely. And of course, we couldn't get DNA because of the fire. And the VIN number matched Roger Hollister's truck. It was then obvious that Roger Hollister had destroyed that truck and was attempting to conceal it. At that point, we had what we thought was a very good circumstantial case against Roger Hollister. We searched the property, but we still didn't have a body of Patricia Kimmy. Our prosecutor kept saying, we need a body. Then, a few weeks after finding the truck, investigators get some alarming news. I received a phone call from investigators who said, you're never going to believe this. Roger Hollister and Rebecca Hollister were just involved in a vehicle accident. The investigators said that the vehicle had turned in front of a semi-tanker and hit head-on. Rebecca was seriously injured to the point that she had to have surgery. Roger, who was the driver of the vehicle, didn't sustain any real serious injuries. And if the truck driver hadn't paid attention, there's probably a good chance they would have both been killed. Detectives rush to the hospital to speak with the Hollisters. And Roger's wife, Rebecca, tells them she believes her husband was trying to kill them both. Why is he trying to commit suicide? Why is he trying to kill Rebecca in the car? I think that the walls were closing in, and Roger knew it. Roger knew we were closing in on him. There was an arrest warrant issued for Roger Hollister for attempted murder on Rebecca. And he was charged for that. Now in custody, Roger says he wants to tell police what really happened to Pat Kimmy. He said that he was with Eugene when the kidnapping occurred. He said, yes, his truck was used in the crime, but Eugene forced him to go. He said that he just drove Eugene Kimmy and that Eugene Kimmy killed Patricia. And so is Eugene still involved somehow? We don't know for sure. Detectives bring Eugene in for another interview. He admitted that he did not like the situation he was in with his wife, but he says, I would never harm her or kill her. Eugene says, oh yeah, I may have mentioned that I would like to see her dead, but I didn't offer money to Roger to kill her. Eugene Kimmy did not deny that he'd made those remarks, but that he had said it more in anger, you know, just a person running their mouth that's upset with their ex-spouse. Detectives have no solid proof Eugene was with Roger that night or that any money ever changed hands. As a result, we were never able to tie Eugene Kimmy into the murder. 
never had sufficient evidence to charge Eugene Kimmy. Police release Eugene. Then, six months after Pat's disappearance, Rebecca Hollister asked to meet investigators. She was very upset. You could tell that the woman was filled with guilt. She told investigators that she knew where Patricia Kimmy was and she wanted to take them to the body. It's been six months since police believe Pat Kimmy was abducted and murdered. Now their prime suspect's wife, Rebecca Hollister, is at the station and wanting to talk. She told investigators that she knew where the body was, and she told them that the body was at their farm. We were shocked. I think she was realizing that she better come clean, and I think she decided to do the right thing by giving us the body. Rebecca Hollister was offered immunity if she would cooperate with us and be truthful. We would grant her immunity from prosecution. Rebecca claims her husband, Roger, told her where he buried Pat Kimmy on their 40-acre farm. She took us to the property, and she says, I think she's down there, and points towards a ditch. And sure enough, exposed to everybody was about a six to seven inch section of spine. We found a piece of the vertebrae with some ribs attached, and we found another short piece of the ribs. The body was burnt, the body was cut up, the body was crushed. I mean, he destroyed her body. And lucky enough, we found enough of the remains to identify her that we knew we had Patricia Kimmy. One of the officers told me that her body had been dismembered and burned. And that was very hard, one of the hardest days. When we recovered the body, I felt we had a very strong case. I felt we had the right man. I felt we had the evidence to convict him. On June 4th, 2010, Roger Hollister is charged with first degree murder. At the trial, prosecutors present a picture of what they believe happened to Pat the night she was murdered. Roger went to her house, got her to open that door, and when she did, Roger pushed through, was able to grab Patricia, subdue her, and take her out to that truck. He got her into that truck and took off down her driveway. As he turned the corner onto the gravel road, she somehow got away from him. She jumped out of that truck, and he pursued her into that ditch. There was a confrontation. I think she put up one heck of a fight, and she was fighting for her life when she was killed, kicking on that ground. We believe that Patricia Kimmy died on the side of that road where the evidence is found, and that he then got her into that truck returned back to his farm and tried to burn the body and then chopped up what was left and buried it there on the side of the creek. And then he went and tried to get his money. We were never able to recover any financial records indicating any money changing hands. But yet we knew that had to be the motive because Roger Hollister had no other reason to kill Patricia Kimmy other than hoping to being paid by Eugene Kimmy. We believed that maybe Eugene was mouthing off about paying to kill Patricia and that Roger heard that. I think that Eugene made one of those drunken comments that he would like to see his wife dead and Roger acted alone and went out and done it. That was a very big shock. You really couldn't make up a case like this. And it really was like something written for TV, but it wasn't, it was real. To cut a body up and burn a body up, that's one of the most evil things you can do. It was very unexpected. There was a lot of twists and turns, but ultimately we just wanted justice for mom. 
on March 1st, 2011, a jury finds Roger Hollister guilty of murder. At the sentencing, Roger got life without the possibility of parole. So we knew once he was in prison, he was not coming out until it was a pine box. Two years after being convicted, Roger Hollister dies in jail from ill health. You know, I don't know if that will ever seem fair that he spent such a short time in prison. It wouldn't be enough if it was a thousand years for taking our mom's life. I think we all just hope to be half of the person that she raised us to be. Our mother was a saint on earth, the kindest woman you'd ever meet. There is no doubt in my mind she's in heaven with God above. You just miss her every day. A brilliant, free-spirited college student. Barbara was very creative. She was always very theatrical. I always thought she was a genius because everything came so easy to her. Is found brutally murdered in a mountain canyon. We could see five or six gunshot wounds. There was some speculations that she had been sexually assaulted. A clue left by the victim leads to surprising suspects. He finds this note addressed to all the Mormon roommates that she was leaving to go be with her people. Just how bad was this relationship with her roommates, and what could it cause anyone to do? And a series of bizarre twists. He's telling us that bullet holes were in a triangular pattern, and that's a sign of a possible Satan killing. Somebody took her up there into the woods. This was potentially a sacrifice. Until the evidence reveals a killer no one saw coming. There was DNA from the soil that was underneath her body. It was like finding a needle in a haystack, a big haystack. It just didn't seem like somebody who would kill somebody. It was just the biggest shock you could fathom. Provo, Utah, a small college town in a picture-perfect mountain setting. Provo sits in a county south of Salt Lake. It's where the Brigham Young University campus is at. It's a very safe community. During the 1970s, uh, Provo was definitely a, a place that was very low on crime, and uh, you didn't have to worry about locking your doors at night. That innocence is lost on a cold March afternoon in 1974 when a grisly discovery in a nearby canyon sends shockwaves through the community. On March 11, 1974, the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office received a telephone call from a power company worker who had started walking up from the power plant. And as he was cutting through some brush, he came across a white female with gunshot wounds to her back. The crime scene is essentially a couple miles up what we call Big Cottonwood Canyon. Investigators race to the canyon where the utility worker leads them to the body. We could see five or six gunshot wounds. Uh, all of them look to be in her back or in her arm. The shot placements look like execution type shots and it looked like she had been there for a few hours at least. With the way that her body was positioned, we felt like sexual assault was part of this crime scene. Her arms were tucked up underneath her. Uh, that told us that she was in pain, that she was fearful of what was happening to her. We're looking for things like drag marks, but the ground around the body was not disturbed. It looks like where she was is where she was killed. Detectives are struck by an unusual detail. Her clothes were folded neatly and piled towards the top of her head. We suspected that the victim was probably trying to buy some time. As she was being told to undress, she was stacking her clothes in this neat pile. More evidence is revealed when they turn the victim over. We found some 
possibly 38 caliber bullets that were recovered after they had gone through the victim's body. We also picked up some soil and logged it into our evidence room. The detectives back in the 70s, they didn't have the DNA that we have in today's uh, crime scene investigations. They focused on all kinds of trace evidence like the soil, fibers, hairs may link the suspect to that scene. While the body is taken to the morgue, detectives interview their only witness. The only thing we really knew at this point was a utility worker had found this body and we were able to clear him fairly quickly, but we didn't know who the victim was. We didn't have any other real suspects to go with at that point. We got a hold of the local media, let them know that we had a, a white female, Jane Doe, that we were trying to identify. Later that night, we received a telephone call from the Brigham Young University Police Department that they had received a missing person report of a white female earlier that day. The missing person in Provo matched the description of our Jane Doe. The missing person is 22-year-old student Barbara Jean Rocky, but police need a formal identification to be sure she's also their murder victim. We made a phone call down to a couple of the guys that were hanging out with Barbara. Jerry Hicker is the one that filed the missing persons report. Jerry is also a student at BYU, and he was a friend of Barbara's and some of her roommates. Edward Fisher and Jerry Hicker went to the morgue to do an identification on our Jane Doe. Edward and Jerry confirm the murdered woman is Barbara Rocky. Police now face the difficult task of informing her family. At the time of Barbara's murder, my parents were living in California. My mom found out first from the police and was crying. And from then on, nothing was the same. It was just the biggest shock you could fathom. It's like what you knew of the world has just imploded. Born in 1952, Barbara had an idyllic childhood growing up in Menlo Park, California. Barbara was very creative. She was always very theatrical. I always thought she was a genius because languages and uh, music came so easy to her. Barbara was always rooting for the underdog. If somebody needed help, she would open doors for them. I mean, always doing something very sweet. When the time came to go to college, Barbara's choice reflected a growing spiritual interest. Barbara was always searching for a religion. Barbara was interested in the Mormon religion. My parents were very happy for her to go to Brigham Young because they felt that she would get the safe group of friends and the good education and religion that she required. When Barbara went off to college, she seemed up and happy and like things were going well. Investigators ask Barbara's loved ones if they can think of anyone who might be responsible. Since she was away at college and out of our supervision, we had no idea what she was doing. We just didn't know what kind of friends she was making. In speaking with the family, they just had no idea on who could have done this to her. With the family unable to provide leads, detectives hope her college friends might be able to point them in the right direction. Ed Fisher was dating one of uh, Barbara's roommates when asked uh, if he had any idea who would have done this to Barbara, he just had no idea. He felt Jerry Hicker might have more information about Barbara than he would. Jerry Hicker is also a student at BYU, and Barbara seemed to spend lots of time with him. Jerry described that he was just devastated that this had happened to Barbara. He knew Barbara very well. Police asked Jerry what led him to file a missing persons report just hours before Barbara was found dead. He said that he had gone skiing the day before, uh, used Barbara's car to take the skis back, and then he met up with Barbara on March 11th at about 10 o'clock in the morning and gave the car keys back with plans to meet up later on to go grocery shopping. After leaving Barbara, Jerry spoke with one of Barbara's roommates, and then he went to study at the library. 
Later that day, Jerry and Barbara had plans to grab some food, but she didn't show up. As Jerry left the BYU campus, he walked past Barbara's house and he didn't see Barbara's car, so he continued towards his home. And as he was passing the Park Plaza apartments and sees Barbara's car sitting in the parking lot, which was someplace that Barbara would have never parked her car. He said that was kind of odd, why it would have been parked where it's not normally parked inside the car. He finds this note that was left by Barbara. It's addressed to all the roommates that basically said that she had found her people, that she was leaving to go be with her people. I think that he looked at it as a suicide note, and so he took the note over to the roommates, and that raised enough suspicion to report her as a missing person. In order to clear Jerry as a person of interest, Detectives drilled deeper into his timeline. Jerry gave his timeline up until uh, that evening, and essentially once he found that letter, he came and talked to us. Jerry reported her missing, he found the note, he was cooperating with detectives, so he really wasn't somebody that fit as a suspect. When detectives asked Jerry about any conflicts Barbara may have had, he mentions one unexpected source. Jerry tells investigators that the roommates and Barbara kind of have an off-again, on-again relationship. Barbara Jean Rocky lived with seven other women from Mormon families. Barbara sometimes liked to do things for shock value, and this is not a place people go to to shock others. There was a little bit of intimidation between Barbara and some of the girls. Jerry said that things had gotten so bad that he had uh, tried to find Barbara another place to live. Was it possible one of Barbara's roommates could be the culprit behind her death? Just how bad was this relationship that Barbara Jean Rocky had with her roommates, and what could it cause anyone to do? Coming up, detectives uncover dark secrets. The majority of the roommates were, were very religious. He had a relationship with Barbara Jean and had been dating one of her roommates. A love triangle could easily turn deadly when there's jealousy involved. He had pulled a dagger on her and said he was going to stab her. And links to a terrifying killer. She described him as a great warlock and maybe even a devil worshiper. There's women all over the American West that are going missing and being discovered dead. This guy turns out to be probably the most famous, notorious serial killer of all time. Until the evidence reveals the horrific truth. He was not who we suspected, and so to learn that he was responsible for killing her was very surprising. After 22-year-old college student Barbara Rocky is found shot dead, police have discovered she had clashed with her roommates and bring them in separately for questioning. The roommates had only known her since January when Barbara moved into the house and going to the predominantly Mormon uh, school. Barbara really didn't fit that mold. She was from California and she was more of a free spirit. She was uh, somebody who was very opinionated and was not a conformist. Barbara Jean Rocky's roommates say that she was kind of dating around, not necessarily saving herself from marriage, and it was generally not accepted. The roommates were very religious. They attended church faithfully. I think Barbara would probably experiment with different uh, religions just to expand her knowledge and at times would do things that would maybe scare them. Barbara Jean's roommate said she was um, kind of into witchcraft, so she was attracted to that uh, lifestyle a little bit. They didn't want to be a part of Barbara's life, so they would keep her at arm's length. Had one of Barbara's roommates lashed out and done something unthinkable? Being more of uh, the typical LDS BYU student, you just wouldn't think that somebody like that could kill somebody. But until you do the, the leather work on it, you can't clear them. Detectives work to verify the roommate's alibis. Once the investigators corroborated all the stories and looked at the timelines, they were able to clear the roommates as not being somebody that had killed Barbara. As detectives continue asking the roommates about Barbara, they learn some startling new information. 
investigators found out through the interviews of the roommates that Barbara would carry a 357 revolver pistol. Some of the roommates described Barbara as being maybe a little bit paranoid, where she would um, think people were following her. In 1974, people weren't just walking around with guns the way they do today. So if a 21-year-old college kid was walking around with a 357 Magnum pistol, who is she afraid of? Detectives get more surprises when they search Barbara's vehicle. When the investigators looked in the rear of the vehicle and they found ammunition and targets, things that you wouldn't expect in a female BYU student's car. Did Barbara feel like she needed to have a gun? Did she practice with the gun? Was somebody after her? We weren't sure what all of that meant at that point. The car was fingerprinted, but there was just nothing of good forensic value that we could come up with at that time. With more questions than answers, detectives turned their attention back to the note Barbara's friend Jerry had found earlier in Barbara's car. They found a victim shot multiple times and then someone else finds this note in her car that says she's leaving to be with her people. And what's the purpose of this? The investigators were wondering if the note was even authored by Barbara. So they do some handwriting analysis on it and send it out to have that done. While detectives await results, the autopsy report comes in. At that time, they came up with six bullet hole entrance wounds. The shot in the arm was probably the bullet that killed her because it went back into the chest and hit some vital organs and the final wounds were when Barbara was turned over and on her stomach and the entrance wounds were in her back. Being shot in the back is a good indicator that the person is known by the by the assailant. He doesn't want to see their face uh, when he kills them. At the autopsy the medical examiner took swabs of both her rectum and her vaginal area uh, to try to preserve any evidence that might be there. The autopsy report indicated no definitive evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. With the autopsy offering no new leads, investigators turned their focus to any romantic relationships Barbara may have had. They were talking with the roommates more about other men that may be in Barbara's life, and uh, they came up with a guy named Richard. They knew that Barbara was very much infatuated with him. She spoke about him all the time, even called him uh, her boyfriend. As police focus on Richard, they make a disturbing discovery. They had asked if Richard had ever been violent towards Barbara, and Barbara had relayed one story that Richard had pulled a dagger on her and said he was going to stab her. This was not the only alarming story Barbara's roommates relayed to detectives. About a month before Barbara was murdered, she reported that her gun was missing, and that raises all kinds of concerns. She reported it to campus police, and then, to my knowledge, she never got that gun back. A 357 revolver would have fit with the potential murder weapon that killed Barbara. She had expressed concern to her roommates that the person that had taken the gun may use that gun on her, and the roommates just kind of dismissed it. But now that Barbara was found shot to death, the roommates were concerned for themselves as well. Having that information, uh, the investigators really wanted to find out who Richard was. At this point, all we have is Richard's first name. He's willing to maybe take a dagger and stab her. We strongly felt that he could have been responsible for her murder. Three days have passed since student Barbara Rocky was discovered shot dead in Big Cottonwood Canyon. And police are hunting a man named Richard, who they believe is her boyfriend. This could be the person that killed Barbara, but all we have is Richard's first name, and so we're kind of running into a dead end. With no way to identify their potential prime suspect, detectives catch a lucky break. Out of the blue, a guy named Richard Finder calls into our department and tells us that he knew Barbara Rocky. Richard Finder initiated contact, offering his services to um, basically try to help them solve this case. 
first question we had was, is this the Richard that we've been looking for? As investigators prepare to meet with Richard Finder, they learn everything they can about him. We find out that he's in his 30s, and he's a self-proclaimed psychic. He lived in California. Barbara was from California, so that was one of the connections that they had. We also found out that a 357 uh, pistol was registered to him, which is obviously the same caliber that we're looking for. Richard Finder arrives at the sheriff's office, and detectives begin by asking him about his relationship with the 22-year-old college student. Barbara heard Richard Finder on the radio talking about the occult. Barbara had called into the radio station. Uh, they ended up exchanging phone numbers. Barbara had gone up to see him at his hotel, and I think Barbara at one point even felt that Richard was her boyfriend. Richard claimed that it was just a spiritual relationship, that he looked at uh, Barbara not in a physical way. Under further questioning, Richard mentions something that gets the detective's attention. The place that he was staying at was very close to the uh, mouth of the canyon where it was that Barbara Jean was found. Detectives cut to the chase and ask Richard where he was on March 11th, the day that Barbara was killed. He tells him that he was in Salt Lake at the time of the murder. He said that he had gotten up and had some breakfast, and then he went over and helped a friend do some construction work on a house all day long, and then he went back home and uh, went to sleep on the couch. Detectives set to work, checking out Richard's alibi. The guy that Richard Finder was staying with did confirm that Richard was with him in the evening, but he could not confirm the times that Richard told us about during the daytime. With holes in Richard's alibi, detectives dig deeper into his claims about his relationship with Barbara. Our investigators talked to Barbara's therapist, and she just really got the impression that Barbara was in love with, with Richard. The therapist reveals another way the relationship was less innocent than Richard made it seem. Barbara described Richard as a great warlock and maybe even a devil worshiper. I think that uh, the satanic uh, and the witchcraft, it's not too far-fetched to think, okay, somebody took her up there into the woods. This was potentially a sacrifice. When police confront Richard with these allegations, his response is even more alarming. He's telling us that he's having these dreams and, and that she was shot in the back in a triangular pattern and uh, that that's a sign of a possible Satan killing or devil worship. Richard also told us that he had a vision that the murder weapon was also thrown into water. How would he know that we didn't have the murder weapon? So that really raised a question to us. We're wondering, is this guy confessing to us? Is he telling us about our crime scene? He has all of this knowledge. Is this guy the one that killed Barbara that day? When you start putting all of these things together, it made Richard Finder a pretty good suspect. Despite the circumstantial evidence stacking up against him, detectives need something more concrete. So we collect all of his weapons for ballistic tests with the projectiles that we located from Barbara's body. We received the results from the ballistics test, and they were not a match. And that pretty much blew up most of our case with Richard Finder. Detectives pin their hopes on the results of the handwriting analysis on the note found in Barbara's vehicle. Maybe she wrote the note under duress. Maybe she was forced to write the note. That could be a significant clue, especially if it's determined that our victim didn't author the note. It's like someone's writing a suicide note for someone else. The handwriting analysis came back and it showed that Barbara was the one that had written the note. The letter itself seemed to be a valid letter to her friends, and several people said, that's Barbara's handwriting. The investigators concluded that maybe uh, Barbara was thinking about moving home, and she was just explaining that in the note. At this point, we're starting to run out of leads. As the investigation stalls, Barbara's family is rocked by another tragedy. My dad would call the police practically every day when nothing was coming to fruition. And he, he died like within a year after she died. It killed my father. And we had so many key relatives die. 
still wanting to know what happened to Barbara. Detectives never give up on the case, and a year later, in 1975, they notice a disturbing pattern of crimes. There's women all over the American West that are going missing and being discovered dead. College co-eds with dark hair were found murdered, and the serial killer was certainly the big topic of conversation. A surprising arrest changes the whole course of the investigation. In 1975, a Utah State trooper makes an arrest west of Salt Lake City. The suspect was arrested for a kidnapping case, and some of the evidence in the vehicle definitely could have had something to do with Barbara's murder as well. The driver's name is Ted Bundy. This guy turns out to be probably the most famous, notorious serial killer of all time. Is he the one that killed Barbara? A year and a half after the murder of Barbara Rocky, the investigation is sparked back into life by the arrest of notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. More and more that police start investigating Ted Bundy, the more connections they find to missing and murdered women all over the country. In 1974, Ted Bundy was also in uh, the Utah area, going to school at the University of Utah. Barbara Jean fit Ted Bundy's profile. She was a college student. She was a brunette, and she was the age that Ted Bundy seemed to target. Ted Bundy had a reputation of being a very charming man. You know, he was a good-looking guy and uh, was kind of a smooth talker. Ted Bundy would act like he was hurt and ask for some assistance from a female, and that would have fit right with the personality of Barbara. She would have helped Ted Bundy if he had approached her. With Barbara fitting the profile of Bundy's victims, detectives connect with the FBI. The investigators were able to get a hold of a timeline uh, that the FBI had prepared, find out what his whereabouts were on March 11, 1974. When the investigators looked at Ted Bundy's timeline, they found that he had an ironclad alibi for that day because he was in Washington committing another murder. With Bundy cleared, the Barbara Rocky investigation grinds to a halt. The investigators had done everything forensically that they could. They had done all the interviews that they could. They had looked at all the suspects that they could. And the case just went cold. Once the case was cold, um, we pretty much accepted that it was not going to be solved. When a case goes cold, it, it definitely affects the family every bit as much, if not more, than the, the investigator. They just want someone to be held accountable for their daughter's death. The case lies unsolved for 30 years, while Barbara's family yearns for answers. The hope and the drive to crack this case someday was powered by losing so many family members that were enraged and wanted justice. So we had nothing to lose by trying. In 2005, Barbara's loved ones make one last push for justice. I asked mom, I said, do you want me to try to open this? And she said, yes, because I need to know before I die. I was a fairly new homicide detective and my phone rang and it was one of the family members saying, hey, my, my sister was killed back in 1974. Our mom's getting up in years and she'd really like to know who killed her daughter. The family would expect us to just do what needs to be done to solve their case. And you can't put a price tag on this level of justice. Digging into the 30-year-old case files, detectives' attention is drawn to one suspect in particular, the self-proclaimed psychic, Richard Finder. I was not convinced that law enforcement had closed the door all the way on Richard Finder. I wanted to look into Richard further uh, because the timeline to me wasn't rock solid. And I wanted to try to look more into the, the forensic end of it. DNA and, and the ballistic stuff has uh, come a long ways since 1974. As I'm looking through each piece of evidence, I'm trying to figure out if that would have any forensic benefit to having tested. 
While evidence from the original crime scene is sent to the crime lab, investigators dig deeper into Richard's version of events. As I started looking at, at Richard's alibi, um, I, I spoke with some of the same people that the investigators had spoke with previously. As we reinvestigated and re-interviewed these people, information that wasn't known back then was revealed. What I learned was that Richard had been uh, dating and seeing a friend of Barbara's, Janelle. But then Barbara also found that Janelle was getting closer to Richard Finder than Barbara was. And there was some animosity from what I understand regarding that. I learned that sometime very close to the murder, Richard had left town with Janelle Bach and Richard and Janelle became boyfriend and girlfriend and that was kind of a blow to, to Barbara. That really kind of stuck out to me. Janelle came back uh, to Salt Lake for three or four days around the time of the homicide with Richard Finder and they were staying at a house just west of the mouth of the canyon where Barbara was found. Had Barbara confronted Richard about Janelle only for the encounter to turn fatal? Because of this uh, relationship between Janelle and Barbara and because Richard Finder supposedly had guns and then because of his witchcraft and the possibility of human sacrifice, Richard Finder was up there on the list as a potential suspect. Investigators tried to bring Richard in for another interview. Unfortunately, we found that Richard Finder uh, had passed away. So really, the only avenue I had was to go uh, talk with Janelle. Was Janelle the only living person who knew what really happened to Barbara? I didn't see any information in the case file where Janelle Bach had really given a good interview about Richard Finder, and so that was the place that I wanted to start. Barbara was upset that Janelle had essentially taken Richard Finder, so when they came back, there's this potential triangle and some jealousy. Uh, it placed some suspicion on Janelle. Anytime an investigation reveals some sort of a love triangle that can easily turn deadly when there's jealousy involved, and all of a sudden, the whole thing shifts from one guy to the person that's least suspected. Three decades after Barbara Rocky was found murdered in a Utah canyon, Cold case detectives want to speak to Barbara's former roommate, Janelle, who had been dating Richard Finder, the psychic Barbara had fallen in love with. Janelle was looked at because of this triangle and this dispute, and Richard Finder was aware that there was this jealousy. Detectives want to know if either Richard or Janelle had the opportunity to kill Barbara. They were back in Salt Lake for three or four days on a ski trip during the time of Barbara's demise, but they never went skiing. And they were staying at a place that was uh, close to the crime scene where Barbara was found. Janelle was able to give me a timeline that she was with Richard that day, uh, and the hours that she wasn't coincided with the, the times from the initial investigation. It was confirmed with others that she was very sick when she came up here. She didn't even leave the house, and she was being taken care of by Richard Finder uh, during the time of the homicide and was not in that area. Janelle Bach he was able to give me enough information to make me feel that he definitely was not the killer of Barbara, and she was not a suspect any longer. Undeterred, detectives scour through the files from 1974, looking for details the original investigators may have missed. As I was going through the case file, uh, Jerry Hicker's name kept popping up. So Jerry's early role in the case was, uh, he was one of the last people to allegedly have seen Barbara Jean at about 10 o'clock in the morning. He reported her missing, so he really wasn't somebody that they were looking at as having a role in her, in her death. They were really good friends that came through in the investigation but I wasn't satisfied about him not being a suspect. Detectives reach out to Barbara's former roommates, asking them about Jerry. Some of the roommates told me that, you know, Jerry just didn't have a lot of friends, and Barbara was accepting of everybody. And Jerry just kind of latched on to Barbara, and I think 
Uh, Jerry had more romantic feelings for Barbara than Barbara did for him. I think that the roommates kind of looked at Jerry as basically kind of a stray pet that people were taking care of. He just didn't seem like somebody who would kill somebody. When investigators dig into Jerry's life after Barbara's murder, they make a disturbing discovery. Jerry had been uh, accused of rape in the Provo area after Barbara's murder. When I found that Jerry was arrested for a sexual assault, I want to know, could Jerry have been the one that killed Barbara? Barbara's roommate had been away from Jerry for a long time. In the interviews, uh, I found out that Jerry really had an obsession with guns, that he helped Barbara find the 357 that she bought. He took her out, showed her how to shoot the 357. Jerry would always tell Barbara about how to load her firearm, leaving one of the cylinders in the revolver uh, empty. And then looking back and seeing that Barbara was shot five times, is that relevant in this case? We actually looked at the Emmy's report, and we couldn't really determine if she had been shot five or six times. There was the opinion that it was six, but it could have also been through the re-entries and fragments, could have been five. As I'm going through these interviews and I'm listening to what the roommates are telling me he was a rock-solid suspect at this point. Detectives race to track down Jerry Hicker. I went to Jerry Hicker's house in Washington, explained to him that I was looking at the Barbara Rocky case. Jerry immediately said, uh, you'll have to talk with my attorney, and that he wasn't going to give me a statement. So at that point, I had nothing else to do but leave. With Jerry refusing to cooperate, investigators must find concrete evidence to link him to Barbara's murder. We wanted to see if with uh, today's technology, that if there was a sexual assault, that there might be something suitable for DNA testing. I was pretty excited to find that a vaginal and rectal swab had been taken on Barbara because by now we were utilizing DNA testing and I thought that I was going to be able to match those up with DNA that we got from whatever suspects were in the case file. Investigators hope that the swab test results will point toward Jerry. They didn't know about DNA in 1974 and they packaged everything in plastic. Because it was packaged in plastic, it ruined any DNA that was in any of the biological material that was taken. I was devastated. I thought I was going to be able to solve that case uh, really quickly, but that's not what happened. Fearing that the case will go cold again without solid evidence, investigators gamble on another way to obtain the evidence they're looking for. I took items that had not been tested yet from the original evidence to our crime lab to have them tested. The original crime scene evidence includes a soil sample from beneath Barbara's body. I was just uh, more or less taking the dirt out to have a sample taken in case some seminal fluid had migrated down into the dirt. There was still the belief based on the scene and everything that there was a possibility of a sexual assault. When I got the results of the test, surprisingly, we got a match that there was DNA from the soil that was underneath Barbara's body. After 30 years, had DNA analysis finally identified Barbara's killer? And what came back as a result of that testing was shocking. It's been 33 years since student Barbara Rocky was found stripped and shot in Big Cottonwood Canyon, Utah. In 2007, DNA in a soil sample from under her body finally reveals her killer. Finding that DNA uh, in the soil was like finding a needle in a haystack, a big haystack. The results come in and we've got a match and it's Jerry Hicker. Just that little bit of information was all that we needed to link Jerry Hicker to this crime scene. He was not who we suspected initially. And so to learn that he was the one responsible for killing her was very surprising. On November 6th, 2007, 56-year-old Jerry Hicker is charged with the first-degree murder of Barbara Rocky. When I first found out that the killer 
of Barbara was Jerry Hicker. I was surprised because I heard that he was just sort of a guy from next door. It was a shock. I never thought it would be solved. As prosecutors prepare for their day in court, they piece together a theory of how Jerry killed Barbara. So our belief of what happened was Jerry Hicker knew that Barbara may be leaving because that next morning, and he was aware of the letter before he brought the car back. I think what tipped him over the edge was he wanted Barbara uh, sexually, and her rejection and her indication of leaving Jerry was more than he could take. Hicker winds up talking Rocky into going up Big Cottonwood Canyon with this scenic view one more time before she leaves. And when they get to this spot, Jerry's trying to put the moves on Barbara, and she doesn't want to have anything to do with Jerry that way. Hicker takes out a gun, and in rage, he tells her to strip down, and she was probably folding the clothes in order to buy herself a little more time. Barbara's pleading for her life. She's just trying to get anything into Jerry's mind to not do this. And then he shot her, apparently, while she was standing up. And then she went down, and then he shot her four times in the lower back region. After the murder, Jerry tried to cover his tracks. Jerry has to drive back to the campus. He gets rid of the gun, and he's trying to come up with alibis. He knows he can't park the car right there at Barbara's house, so he takes it over to the Parkway Plaza apartments, and that's where he decides he's going to use this letter making her a missing person. This was a, a young woman who trusted somebody. They're supposed to be going to a nice spot, and instead she shot and murdered. I felt so horrible knowing that she had gone through something like that. She was probably so scared. Nobody deserved to die like that. Nobody. I believe that Jerry was being the concerned, loving friend, and that may have put some thoughts in the investigator's mind that there's just no way Jerry could have done this. Beneath the facade just seemed to be rage and uh, anger that he'd been rejected. I think Jerry Hicker was a sexual predator. They got away with a lot of crimes. We were so glad and so grateful that the detectives had worked so hard. It boggled my mind that they could solve it after 34 years. Despite an airtight case against Jerry, his declining health leaves prosecutors with a new dilemma. When I went to arrest Jerry, he had been diagnosed with cancer. He was just the shell of a man. We didn't feel that his lifespan was much of five years, if that. So we worked out a deal that he would plead to a substantially reduced charge of manslaughter and that he would be sentenced to the prison for five years, figuring that that would be a life sentence. Going with the plea deal was my mom's um, decision. She wanted him to say in his own words that he did it. She wanted those answers. Jerry Hicker serves three years in Utah State Prison. And in 2014, five years after pleading guilty, he dies of cancer. I bet you he had been looking over his shoulders all these years. I felt that his ill health was Barbara's justice. This is somebody that wasted away not only his life. He ruined so many people's lives by his selfish act. Barbara didn't deserve this. She had so much ahead of her, but the family does have some answers. That's the goal in my investigation. I think that uh, in this case, justice was served and that the family uh, got answers that they would not have otherwise had. The thing I miss most about Barbara was the times that we used to blast Beatles music and sing and dance for hours and just being kids, you know? I remember her then. Barbara was such a giving person. I feel inspired by her uh, ability to give of herself. And, um, and I try to emulate that.